Members of Council, if I can please have you take your seats. Members of Council, this meeting is now resumed. Uh, before the recess, Council was considering the Mayor's first key item, EX 29.1 on Smart Track Project Update and Next Steps. Before we return to that item, I would take the release of Member Holtz. If you, if you do have a release, you can put your name up, request to question staff. Does anybody have any quick releases? Councillor Davis. Just trying to find government management. It's on page 9, GM 23.23, PEGA Construction Limited Disqualification from City Contracts, Fair Wage Policy Non-Compliance. I'd like to just release that. Okay, on page 9, GM 2323, <coughs> Councillor Davis is releasing. All in favour? Carried. Thank you. Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. On page 14, TE 28. 6, 722, 750, and 783 College Street Zoning Amendment Application, I would just like to very quickly point out that this is legalizing three existing live music venues that have for decades been in nonconformity. Um, so we'll fix that pending what is the request to our licensing staff uh, to bring back a new uh, licensing um, uh, regime for live music venues. So this is exciting, good news, legalizing live music venues in the City of Toronto. Okay, so that's on page 14, T28.6. Councillor Layton is Three releasing. On favour? Carried. Councillor Ainsley? Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. On page 6, EX29.30, Fleet Services Division 2017 Capital Budget and 2018 to 2026 Capital Plan Adjustments and Accelerations. I can release that. Okay, on page 6, EX 29.30, Councillor Ainsley is releasing. All in favour? Carried. Thank you. Now, I do have um, a number of... Not yet? Okay. All right, um, before we start, I believe that... Let five go, add ten on. Do we have 30 members? Okay, I do have a number of members' motions to be introduced. We have 30 members, but before I do that, I just want to acknowledge, uh, it's my understanding that we have some students from Harvard Collegiate. Are they here? Welcome. And then we also have some students from York University working on a public policy research project with Councillor Grimes and uh, Nargis Shokir and Luca Della Pena. Welcome. Okay, so who's up first? Councillor Wang Tam. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I'd like to introduce this particular motion uh, as the province of Ontario requires confirmation of the city's uh, support, support uh, for the project by the year end. Okay, all in favour, carried. Councillor Carroll. Uh, Madam Speaker, oh, there it is. Um, I, I didn't have a copy of this. Uh, yes, Madam Speaker, this is a, a motion that needs to be deemed urgent because it needs to uh, get to the T Lab uh, as early as possible. Okay. On favor? Carried. Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Speaker. Um, well, uh, there's a motion there that. Uh, allows us to renew a grant program, and it's urgent because it's free money. Okay, thank you. All in favor, carried. Councillor Thompson, you have another one. All right, it's a busy day. Let's see what it is. Right, uh, so speaker, this is an opportunity for us to be uh, prepared for a celebration 
<laughs> Council Carroll says to blow stuff up with pyrotechnics. Uh, hopefully that the uh, Toronto FC will win the game and we'll be able to yeah. celebrate and uh, have fireworks in the square. Okay, all in favor? Yes, all in favor of winning. Carried. Who's next? Councillor Cressy. Uh, thank you, Speaker. This item is urgent. It, it is technical in nature because any delay could impact the construction timeline for the completion of the YMCA. On favor? Carried. Councillor Cressy. Uh, thank you, Speaker. This item is urgent as it relates to the legal description of the bylaw because any delay will impact the timelines for the construction of the project. On um, favor, carried. Councillor Cressy. Sorry. Come on, Joe. <laughs> we want to get out of it. <laughs> Me too. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, this is uh, the release of Section 37 funds for the completion of a greening project. It is urgent so that the work can commence on schedule. On um, favor, carried. Pardon? That's it. Okay, before we sta uh, start, we have uh, just want to welcome students, journalism students from Centennial College, and it's in Councillor Fragadakis' ward. Welcome. Thank you. Our next speaker, Councillor Kergiannis. Madam Speaker, I'll speak from the. Oh, I know the <coughs> Okay, start. You can start. Can I get this to. Uh... Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Before I start, I have a motion that I'd like to uh, okay. put up. Okay. If you can introduce your motion. Uh, the City Council directs staff to include as part of the stage five report the opportunities for city to work with private sector developers, including the opportunity to provide commuter parking integrated with a larger developer development concept associated with land that's required to construct new local access roads on the east side of Finch Kennedy Station. Madam Speaker, um, the reason that I'm moving this, and I was going to, if I can have this, the staff, but okay, this is the map. If you look at two points, point number one and point number two. Point number one is uh, Shepherd and Kennedy. There's a GO station right there. We own property. We own 90 parking spots that we're selling to Metrolinx, and we're releasing that at 2038000 Going a little higher at this uh, area right here which is the um, Finch and Kennedy, which is about two kilometers north of there. Uh, staff came to talk to me about uh, proposed uh, GO station, and the uh, situation was that we're going to have probably about 220, 230 parking spaces. They evaluated, and they were told by Metrolinx that that could cost about $30 million, including a loop of the buses, that the number's gone a little bit south. So when you look at down here on the south end, if you look on the south end, 90 parking spaces, 2 million, and when you come up here, 220 spaces comes to about anywhere between 6, 8, 9 million, whatever it is, and we were told this morning we don't know about the number, but we will speak offline. That certainly has me concerned. It has me concerned when we look at designing a GO station and we're talking about absolutely putting no parking. Madam Speaker, I'm going to sort of give you a scenario for my colleagues to follow. If you live in the subdivision right here, right in the middle, somewhere there, and you want to get on to, um, to a TTC bus to go to the GO station. You're looking at about a 10-minute walk from your house to the uh, TTC bus stop, the, the, the bus route. You're looking at another 15-minute ride. That takes you to about half an hour to get from here to here or from here to here to the, to the uh, GO station bus stop. If that's going to take you half an hour on the bus versus 10 minutes in your car, 
A lot of the people that live up in my area, a lot of the people that live north of 401 will say, the hell with it, I'm going to drive downtown. The congestion happens north of the 401 and 401 being down here. From Shepherd, uh, from um, Pharmacy and Steels to Shepherd and Victoria Park, it can take you up to 35, 40 minutes in order to drive down there. If you punch through and you're going south of uh, 401, it's very easily to go downtown. And if we're going to encourage people not to take the car, and if we're going to encourage people to park, thank you to my colleagues for listening, especially to, the right, to my right side. If we're going to encourage people to get on the bus and come downtown, we've got to make sure that we have ample parking that they can drive to. We've got to make sure that we have ample bus routes. Unfortunately, Madam Speaker, in subdivisions, in these subdivisions, there's no um, way for the TTC. We have no, absolutely no bus routes. And for people to go to the bus route, it will take them 10 to 15 minutes. If it's winter time, it's after hours. If you're a female, you will certainly think about it twice before you would walk out to there. So if we're going to encourage people to get out of their cars and get to ride the better way downtown or the GO station, we will have to provide parking. And I want to thank um, staff for working with me. Uh, it wasn't, um, it was after a little bit of pushing and shoving that uh, we were able to do this, and especially I want to thank uh, city staff for holding a special meeting in my area to address this issue on October the 19th. I'd like to make sure that we have parking. I'd like to make sure that we address the issue of parking, be it paid parking or free parking, uh, for people to be able to go and park. Uh, three P participation, public, private, and in order for people to be able to leave their cars behind and come downtown. Because I would say to my colleagues, anywhere is in here, to, to go from here, for example, to here, or from here to there, it is going to be half an hour. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I'll take any questions that anybody might have at my seat. Thank you. Now we don't have any questions. Councillor Perks to speak. Thank you, Speaker. I have a motion that City Council direct the City Manager and the Interim Chief Financial Officer, I hate using that interim word, to report through the Executive Committee to City Council no later than July 17, 2018, with an update on funding and financing options for, this, for the City for Smart Track slash RER. Members, I've seen this movie before. I, I had the great privilege of co-authoring a report in 2002 with Steve Monroe entitled Transit's Lost Decade. In that report, we documented how through the 90s, the TTC deferred the purchase of vehicles, constraining its fleet size, stopped making investments in service frequency, and drew all kinds of very, very optimistic maps at the time with a, a number of different names for all kinds of new subway lines and ex, uh, expanding uh, the RT and, and all kinds of things that never got built. And we spent a fortune paying uh, for engineering and, and land acquisition and all kinds of stuff. And what it led to was the largest single drop of ridership in Toronto's history. The fact of the matter is that we are going down that road again. We've seen ridership start to flatline. We've seen deep constraints on the TTC operating budget. We've seen recent uh, cancellations of streetcar purchases and deferral of bus purchases. And at the same time, we draw ever more optimistic maps for what we're going to be able to do in terms of capital construction. Just today, uh, we're debating an item where we're considering adding a huge capital cost for undergrounding part of the very area where we once upon a time had a subway plan that uh, was filled in by a provincial government. This is not the path to success. If you look at the, the draft budget that was uh, announced last week, you'll see also that we are moving $300 million out of the planned capital expenditure for this year to a date unknown. And further, that for the first time uh, in 15 years, I believe it is, we are pro proposing a capital budget that means that our state of good repair is going to fall further and further behind every year for a decade. In other words, 
as we keep adding fantasies about what we'll be able to build, ignoring the obvious reality that we're getting from staff advice that we have no capacity to build these things, while simultaneously artificially constraining our ability to do the one thing that actually attracts riders, which is to improve service frequency, we are building a very bleak transit future. And before we go any further down the road of adding new fantasy lines and new fantasy stations and new fantasy underground lines and all of these things that members of this council or people during elections added to the, the capital plan, we need to actually understand what our financial capacity to deliver transit service is so that we'll stop chase chasing ghosts and phantoms and start actually putting service on the street so that ridership stops its decline and starts to grow again. It's absolutely essential that before we leave office at the end of this term, we have realistic financial plans for how we're going to invest in day-to-day -day transit service and have some understanding that we're already have eyes way bigger than our stomachs in terms of the capital plans that we're, we keep adding in at every council meeting or every election. I hope you'll support my motion. Uh, before we continue, I'd like to welcome the grade five students from Franklin Community School located in Ward 30. Their local counselor is uh, Counselor Paula Fletcher and the group leader is Gary Beeler. Welcome. Counselor Carroll to speak. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, uh, my, I have a motion that uh, City Council delete Executive Committee Recommendation 4B. Uh, that being, you can consider it read, it is the, uh, the added direction from the committee to add a working group to continue to discuss uh, 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 extended tunneling. Now, um, I, know, I know that in that committee, the purpose of, of this working group was to assuage the fears of, of, a, of a community that, that hasn't fully digested attachment number two. That's likely the most important reason for working group, uh, setting up a working group. Because there's certainly no money to take this, this uh, uh, Mount Dennis to Renforth and turn it into a subway. There just isn't. But there is. If they had uh, 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 been given the help to understand all the considerations, there are various grade separations being considered here, and sometimes above grade is, uh, is called for, uh, in very exciting ways, in ways not contemplated elsewhere in town, and sometimes below grade is the only option. There will be some tunnels. There will be some below grade things within this line. But I'm removing this consideration because staff have done enough work to know that the, the most affordable, but also the most advantageous from a pure transit planning perspective, the most advantageous way to proceed, to connect the most people, to make the biggest change, the biggest change on changing people's mode of travel to work, is to proceed with the 10 stops. And we know this from, from cities around the world. And what I would hate to see happening now is, again, in an effort to simply politically keep the waters calm while we plan, we keep loading into the hopper something that we can't ever fund. That's a cruel and inhumane thing to do to communities, in my view. We can't ever fund it. We won't ever have enough money. As it is, the cost of this line will surely well, surely because of some of the great separations, it will go up in cost. Just as the, the Scarborough uh, uh, subway has gone up in cost and will continue to go up in cost. But if we start down this road and we continue to keep the littlest flicker of a flame alive of this conversation, that flame begins to grow and grow and grow. 
And pretty soon, we're sending very mixed signals to the other uh, uh, players in this game, Metrolinx, I dare say, uh, uh, the Board of Trade who's talking about what are you doing. Uh, we continue to keep flickers of flames of misunderstanding alive all over town. And the next thing you know, we have the same scenario happening west of Young Street that we have east of Young Street. And that is that we started out with seven stops on a rail line going all the way to Scarborough Centennial College onto the Chinese Cultural Center and able to serve Malvern, one of the most desperately in need of connection places in Scarborough. And one day, seven got cut in half and became three. And then three became one plus. And then the plus disappeared. The nine-stop extension disappeared because there was no funding for it. And now we're down to just the one, just the one in a bus terminal. And those are, no one will argue, some of the most political discussions ever taken. So if we're going to keep this flame alive simply because 2018 is an election year for one and all, no matter what level of government you're for running for, what, well, for all of us, I dare say, Councillor Karagiannis, for all of us, because there are two elections and no one, no one uh, uh, is pretending that's not the case. Some if we're just going to, to, if we're just going to further misinform and keep hope alive for that purpose, we're not doing our community any favors. We need to do really well at designing the system that staff have already told us from the studies thus far they can do and are ready to do now. The only other thing is I would remind you the answer I got from staff on uh, if my motion fails. Know this. If you are starting a working group, while well, that direction says in consultation with local councillors, I've asked staff, and staff have made it their commitment that if you think you're setting up a working group that has no one on it that is a daily commuter on transit, that's not going to happen. There will be riders on that group. But my most humane and my, my fondest wish is that we not even strike this group. Thank, Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Um, Councillor Fletcher. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. I was getting a glass of water when you introduced the fantastic students from Franklin, and I just want to personally say hello to them again and let everyone know that Franklin School is actually built as a school and a City of Toronto Community Centre together. So welcome, Franklin Community School to City Hall. Thank you, Councillor Fletcher. I didn't know you were getting a glass of water. <laughs> okay. Councillor Cressy to speak. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I will be very brief. Uh, I have a motion, if it can be put on the screen, which is to delete the committee recommendation to explore tunneling and to replace it with the staff recommendation to approve the at-grade extension. Uh, and those are all my remarks. Thank you. <laughs> Are you finished, Councillor Cressy? That's it. Oh. Now that was fast. You're the first. Councillor Mahevic, can you um, make it fast? I put, uh, I put a sheet on the board. They're in total, total support. We cannot go down that rabbit hole of exploring tunneling. Here's the reason. If, if you, um, if you can put on base case, at grade, it's $1.5 billion to the airport, about $1.1 billion to Martin Grove, the edge of our city. If you add underground, just three stops, you have to add $1.5 to $2.1 billion. If you want 10 stops, you have to add an additional $250 to $350 million per station. And this is on a part of Eglinton where you can, it's wide enough that you can land a plane. Like this is absolute lunacy to ask staff to go down that road to explore that. There are a lot of good pieces to this, to what is before us here. This piece, we have to nip it in the bud. We've got a good plan. It's already been researched fairly, fairly thoroughly, and we've got to take it to the next step. Sending them on this detour does no one any good and it threatens the entire smart track project. So I would urge my colleagues to not go in this direction. Thank you. 
Thank you. Councillor Campbell. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, it's interesting that the uh, councillor wants to endorse a plan that has been fairly thoroughly researched. <laughs> and um, he points out that uh, you, could, you could land a plane on Long Eglinton. Well, I, I wonder if he's been along Eglinton later, lately, because uh, if you did so, you'd probably you would take out you know six lanes of traffic in some cases. Uh, traffic congestion along Eglinton is unbearable for people in my neighborhood. Uh, traffic, and I, I'm the councillor most affected by this proposed Eglinton LRT. There seems to be the view of some councillors that people in this area are unsupportive of mass transit, and that's not the case. All people are looking for is an opportunity for real consultation. There was a, we had some meetings at uh, a number of the local high schools. People were adamant that they wanted to be listened to in regard to either tunneling, a tunneling option or in regard to grade separations. And when it comes to tunneling, there seems to be this misconception that it would be all the way from Black Creek out to the airport, which is ridiculous, e even, even if you take out the Eglinton Flats. There are opportunities to tunnel a, a part of that roadway that would make a huge difference to the neighborhood. And uh, there's already there's a considerable amount of development that is in the is it, that is in the works along Eglinton Avenue. City Council, in its wisdom, back in 2012, sold all the land or transferred all of the land on the north side of Eglinton to build Toronto. A lot of that land has already been developed. There are some 2,000 units that will be on the books and in, in the planning process in the next uh, in, within the next uh, few years. And residents in our area are really just looking for an opportunity to engage with staff who really haven't looked at the tunneling option in any shape or form. It has not been, it has not been costed out, uh, uh, Councillor Mahavik, it has not been costed out, and different scenarios have not been costed out. So it's, and I find it, it's, all, it's really comical that, uh, that councillors who have subways in their wards, you know, don't want to see it anywhere else in the city of Toronto. And you know, far be it from us to have any, any, far be it from us to even talk or think about the opportunity of, uh, of tunneling. So I think what uh, we're looking for, this is not, uh, this is not uh, an opportunity for us where we're looking for an interminable delay. We know the work that city transportation has put into it. It's our view, it's my view, and it's the view of Councillor Holliday that a more thorough look at some of the options needs to take place. And by the way, if we need people on the working group that take public transit, I'm one, as is Councillor Holliday, and we're more than happy to endorse uh, public transit. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Perks. Thank you, Speaker. Um, Councillor Campbell said something during his speech. I'm sure it was inadvertent, but he made the claim that staff have not looked at tun tunneling in any shape or form. I know he would never impugn staff that way, given that we have a report that mentions the work staff has done to look at certain shapes and forms of tunneling. No, it's okay. Councillor Bailao. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I do have a motion. Um, and uh, the motion is actually to ask that uh, the work that we're doing on the St. Clair Station and the St. Clair Transportation Network take in consideration the expansion north of the West Toronto Rail Path, which has been a goal of ours of the 10-year cycling uh, plan. Um, you, Madam Speaker, Councillor Palacio, have put several motions to make sure that uh, the uh, uh, West Toronto Rail Path is expanded north as well. We are planning all this work. Uh, it should be done and taking consideration at the same time, making sure that we allocate the land necessary for it, and if we don't have it, that we have alternatives to take the path, which is just uh, south of Davenport, uh, to be integrated with public transportation and with a road network as well. So I hope I can get your support. Um, my community is very uh, excited to be able to uh, not only have uh, good trails through the West Toronto Rail Path, but now uh, have the connection of uh, that we've been talking about for many years through the St. Clair Station, through the uh, the Bloor and Dunda Station, through uh, Bloor and Lansdowne, and through the West Queen West. Liberty Station. So uh, we, uh, when we found out a few years ago that uh, the downtown relief line 
was not going to come to the West. We've advocated strongly uh, to have this looked at. Uh, our community uh, very often says that we've been uh, looking at the tra trains go by for way too often, and it's about time that we get on them and make, uh, make good use of them as a, as a commuter line as well. So we're looking forward to be able to, uh, to get on these stations, to get on the trains, uh, to get around using public transportation, but taking full advantage of opportunities that we have to enhance other networks, such, such as the cycling network as well. Thank you. We do have a question. Councillor Lane, three yes, minutes. Yes, thank you very much. If, if the clerk could put the motion on the, on the page, I just want to make sure I understand correctly, because we're looking at integration into the design network of the St. Clair and Old West and Smart Track stations. But is the intent also to integrate it into the uh, Liberty Village station? So that, that work, we are, we are it, it's there. If you look at, there's um, uh, the uh, 99 Sudbury, the building allocates for the rail path behind it as we approved it. There's the connection to the, they're looking at the possible high line, so we are looking into that. In, in, in the north, I haven't seen uh, on the drawing, so I just want to make sure that, that staff are looking at guaranteeing uh, the space uh, and are looking into the network. Fair enough and a good motion. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Palacio. Thank you, Speaker. Is Deputy Mayor Bailao, so it's uh, your motion, the intent of your motion is uh, simply to ensure what has been done in the past because there, there has been a number of requests through notice of motions here uh, adopted by Council that the Toronto the West Toronto Rail Path be extended to the north, exactly what we're doing to the south. Is that Absolutely, Councillor. We've had several votes uh, expressing our uh, full support for the expansion north, uh, but since we are doing this design, we just need to make sure that we allocate for the space beside the tracks, and if it's not there, since the the, the transportation network uh, work is being done as well, that we look at that so that we can expand uh, north of Caribou uh, the, the path as well. But several motions have been put on this floor by, by you, by uh, 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 Speaker Nunziata. The 10-year uh, cycling network, all of it has the West Toronto Rail Path going north. I just want to make sure that we're not, uh, that we are accommodating for that work to be implemented. So you, your motion speaks actually to what the community has been telling us all along that it only makes sense to extend the West Toronto Rail Path to the north to create the connectivity in terms of the, the bicycle master plan with the northern parts of the city. Absolutely. That's, that's your intention, right? Absolutely. We've, we have, both of us have certainly heard that message loud and clear. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Davis to speak. <clears throat> Thank you, Speaker. I have two motions. Um, and they both relate to re including information in the Q2 report that's coming back next year. The first is to include uh, updated ridership, ridership projections in the second quarter report. And the second is to give an update on the status of discussions with Metrolinx to pay for dedicated city staff who are working on RER. Um, I um, have moved uh, the first recommendation, which has to do with ridership, um, because I think it really is incumbent on us to make sure that we have the best information possible when we are now dealing with the next decision that we make. And as we are now learning these so-called stage gate um, processes, um, we know that each step commits us to spending more money and uh, I, I think it's 81 million we've spent so far and by the time we now complete the TPAP, which is the next authorization we're giving, and we get further information, um, we should then have sufficient information to make some final decision about whether to proceed with these stations. But one of the key pieces of information is the ridership. And we have not had an update on the ridership uh, since the original modeling that was done. Um, 
and I know that it's related to what the fares will be, and I sure hope that by that time we'll have better information about what the fares will be that will give us a sufficient understanding about whether or not this project will be successful. Um, and it's a bit of a chicken and egg. You can't decide whether or not to proceed with something until you have the information. And it takes money to spend on doing the design work to get this project to the point that we can accurately estimate the costs. Um, and it's the same problem we have with the Scarborough subway extension. By the time we make a decision to proceed to construction, we will have sunk costs that are huge. So um, we are doing a bit, a bit of a, you know, best guess, but we need to make sure that we're getting the, f uh, the best information possible. Secondly, we have approximately 30 to 40, the equivalent of 30 to 40 full-time staff right now who are working on the RER project from transportation services, planning, water, parks, buildings, they are all working uh, on the RER project and recommendation five says we should go and negotiate with Metrolinx to get that money back because they are using our expertise, our review capacity, to help them with RER. And that's fair, but we want to make sure that they pay for those costs. So the second recommendation simply says, give us an update in Q2 of 2018 on where you are with Metrolinx in securing uh, those costs. Now Metrolinx, uh, has entered into an agreement with the city uh, for the Eglinton Crosstown that they will pay for our staff time that has gone into that project. But I think this is going to ramp up much quicker and we are going to be finding ourselves very quickly with a lot of money owing us um, without clear terms and conditions. So I think it's important that we pin this down uh, by Q2 2018. I also um, will not support us going out and raising expectations that we are going to build a subway in Etobicoke. Thank you. Please, no applause. Councillor Mamaliti. So the, uh, the amendment uh, by Councillor Ford does make sense and anybody that's been around uh, this place a while will know that in fact that was the original plan when the province wanted to build a subway along Eglinton Avenue and then uh, after they ditched that effort after hundreds of millions of dollars was spent in tunneling uh, we continued working that equation in. and even when Mayor Miller at the time introduced a new concept on, on, on Eglinton uh, there was also an agreement that uh, half of that would be underground. And somewhere along the line, uh, someone decided to change that. Uh, and of course, it's always cost that's a factor. But in Etobicoke and the south end of York, they deserve and have been waiting for a particular form of, of transportation uh, that was underground. Uh, so what's happened since then is this council's taken a different turn. Every time and any time uh, a suburban area wants and expects what's rightfully theirs with ridership or otherwise, it's always a no, no matter what. Even if they have the ridership and they can, they can justify that particular argument, this council says no. All you deserve is an above ground LRT and that's all we're going to give you. That's why this, makes, this particular project uh, needs to be uh, sent back with the, with the motion uh, that uh, Councillor Ford has, has brought forward. I won't be supporting uh, this, this report without the tunneling. It won't happen. And I say this to Scarborough uh, councillors as well that are going to be supporting this particular plan. You're supporting the plan, and I know why you're supporting the plan, because you believe in one way or another your particular subway is going to hit your, uh, your community, and, and that... that um, commitment is going to be made to you in the future. 
You are going to lose the subway as quick as you vote for this particular plan. That's what's going to happen here. So if you think you're representing Scarborough by making this particular decision, I'll say this to you, my colleagues, uh, and to everybody in Scarborough, you're going to lose your subway plan if this council has anything to do with it. All right? and, and that, I think, is going to happen in the near future. And it's going to be based on cost again after this particular vote has been taken. And let's get to another part of, of the equation in the suburbs. That's Finch Avenue. Councillor Davis says we should, be, we should have a, an up-to-date count of ridership. Absolutely. I've been saying that right from the beginning. The policy of TTC is if nobody wants to pay, especially along Finch Avenue, don't ask any questions, driver which means they're not counting. And in Jane and Finch, in the, in the area that we're told we don't have the ridership, they haven't been counting for years. 90% of the people that get onto the, onto the Finch uh, buses right now, still to this day, are getting on for free and we're not counting them. How unfair is that? Again, it's the suburbs that would expect, and rightly so, the ridership that warrants it, but we're not counting them, being told that they're not allowed to have a subway, that the only thing they can have is, is the LRT and you have a community that doesn't want it. And so I stand in my place saying, yeah, it's a vision that the mayor has and, and you know, up, up until this point, uh, I, I, have, I have supported that particular vision, but it's always been contingent on the Scarborough subway plan and yes, the tunneling on Eglinton Avenue. If we're going to do uh, these kinds of ventures, then you've got to think about the rest of the city and what our residents want in the rest of the city, and we're not. And lastly, I don't believe that TTC belongs to us anymore. I think we should give it to Metrolinx and let them run it. And quite frankly, we have had all these boondoggles because the politicians have sat on the boards of TTC and otherwise, and let's give it to a group of experts Give them the mandate to deliver what they think makes sense with the, in, in respect to transportation in this city and get it off our hands completely. Because if not, we're just going to be back here time and time again, every time there's a mayor that has his own vision, his own line, and he, and he wants it as a legacy project. That's what's happening here. And while we've done this, everybody else is going to lose out. Scarborough, you're losing out. You're losing out. It's not going to happen. And Eglinton? I recall in 2010 when we had those debates in, in, uh, along that corridor, the solution was the tunneling on Eglinton Avenue and that particular council said yes to that. Now you want to take it away from, from the suburbs again. Congratulations. We, want, we live in a wonderful uh, city that really cares about everybody. Seems to me every time we stand thank, up, thank you, we're trying Councilor to do the Mamadidi. best we can for the suburbs and we lose out every single time. Your, your time is up. Thank you. Councillor Palacio. Thank you, Madam Speaker. First and, uh, first and foremost, I would like to, to make a friendly amendment to, uh, to Deputy Mayor's uh, bylaws motion. In essence, is asking city staff to report back to Council on second quarter of 2018. I did speak to them and they are okay with that. Is, um, I wholeheartedly support the recommendations before us, uh, Madam Speaker. And I think that um, that every time that we are getting this report to City Council, we are getting one step closer. And every step that we take, we are getting closer and closer to the finishing line. For me, for the community that I represent, this will be a dream come true because we've been waiting for too long for this to happen. The construction of the St. Clair, exclusive right away on St. Clair, as you know, it left a lot to be desired. And I've been fighting for years to correct the wrongs that were done is, uh, with the previous administration. And at this point, I think that um, we all know that the status quo is not acceptable anymore. Something needs to be done. We are losing billions of dollars in productivity as well as because of the years of inaction, political indecision, political inertia, and the lack of funding. And on that, I really want to give credit to Mayor Tory for his restless approach on the transit file, for his approach on the smart track transit vision, 
which make, makes a lot of sense. Mayor Tory, he deserves credit because he's been able to bring many of us together. He's been able to bring the other levels of government together when it comes to funding. And this is something that no one has ever done it before. So credit should be given, we should. Locally, we have one of the worst bottlenecks in the city of Toronto. And I'm referring to that section of St. Clair between Old Western Road and Kill Street. An area that where if you dare to drive there, you are inching forward in a bumper to bumper congestion there, which is extremely difficult to navigate for those of us that we have to go through that every single day. The right of way, the way it was constructed, as you know, we spent over $160 million in that project. And now I'm not arguing in terms of the merits of the exclusive right of way, but that project leads to nowhere. It goes from point A to point B to a loop, nothing more than that. But this station, St. Clair, is actually doing something, something very special because that's bringing other modes of transportation, public transit from different routes. It's going to be one of the major transportation hubs in the, in the west end of the city. And that's bringing something new. That's bringing investment to the area. The number of investors that are coming to the area is something that we've never seen it before. And that's good. It's going to be good for development, economic renewal, revitalization, employment. And all of that's part of what we're trying to do here. So Madam Speaker and members of council, I think this report, the recommendations that are before us, it's, uh, they are long due, and I think that what City Council is doing is doing the right thing. And I urge you to support the recommendations that are before us, of course. There is the motion that uh, my dear colleague put forward, as well as I'll be supporting the recommendations from my dear colleagues from the, from the, from the Tobico, because what they've been saying all along is long overdue as well. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cole. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I will be brief, maybe not as much as brief as my councillor, uh, as councillor uh, Cressy was, but I'll just say if we could just maybe, well, let's put Eglinton aside for a moment. And let's take a deep breath on Smart Track or whatever you want to call it, because I think maybe it's the branding that has some people distressed in this room right now. And in fact is, if anyone ever said to you, you know, you know those go lines that run through your neighborhood where you can't use that transit service, you can't get on, it's going to run through your neighborhood, create noise, create all the inconveniences that you don't want, but you can't use that transit. Well, here's an idea. Let's make it more frequent service. Let's make it a local service. Let's add stations so you can take a TTC bus or drive or walk to that, that rapid transit. If that was in front of us without maybe the branding of a certain mayoralty candidate or current mayor you liked or didn't like, or if you weren't on that side or not, I think everyone in this room and most people across the city would say, that makes perfect sense. Why haven't they done this years ago? The track's there. We want to use it. We want the ability to use that rapid transit service to get around our city, to get downtown, to get home. And so that's what's in front of us here. That's what's been in front of us many times before. And this is a moment here we have to continue to advance that work. We've got a provincial partner who sees the wisdom in, in utilizing these assets this way, in leveraging the, the, the track that's in the ground to ensure that more people can get around this city by transit, not in their cars. So we have a provincial government who's doing the work track work is happening right, ne right now, they're willing to give the funding commitments, and we've got a plan in front of us that advances that vision and makes sure that we can use these assets, use the GO network to get around the city, let's advance the recommendations in front of us so we can begin to do that, and so we're not just again talking and debating about transit endlessly, but we're actually building it and getting people moving more quickly through this city. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Kelly. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, just a few uh, observations. Um, the left uh, in this debate uh, seems awfully right-wing uh, in their approach. It's costs, costs, costs. And those uh, who are to the right of centre uh, 
are looking at this through the lens of uh, social uh, or geographic uh, equity. Uh, and speaker, um, no. my take on this uh, is that uh, this city uh, has experienced a remarkable transformation over the last couple of decades. I think that we are poised to become one of the premier cities uh, of this world. But to get there, among other things, you have to, you have to present to the hundreds of thousands of people who are flocking to this city, you have to give them the opportunity to make their con to maximize their contribution to the life of the city. And that means to the huge immigrant populations in the east end of the city and the west and north ends, the ability to access rapid transportation. And so, Speaker, uh, I support any opportunity that creates as much rapid transit as quickly as possible. Um, I remember, I've been participating in these debates for a number of years, and you know, Speaker, if we had built some of those lines when they were originally proposed, we wouldn't have been looking at some of the high costs today that's associated with tunneling and the building of uh, subway stations. Uh, and Speaker, you're nodding your head as well. Um, so in, uh, in summary, um, I know that there are going to be lines that won't have the ridership to support them. But I do know that that line will be supporting the thousands of people that have come here recently and want to participate in the liveliness of this city and the economic uh, rewards that come with that. Thank you. Councillor Holliday to speak. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I'm standing to ask members of uh, council to consider carefully the recommendations put forward by the executive committee. Um, they were not developed lightly, they were developed after a process that just happened over the last month. And to reject the motions placed by Councillor Carroll and Councillor Cressy. I'm also going to say about Councillor Ford's motion that I really, really appreciate the intent. There are a couple of fatal flaws in there that um, caused me concern, including the fact that you cannot grade separate at Islington because of the slope of the earth there. If you read the report in the cross section, it's very is very detailed. Uh, I can't support something that takes away stations because these stations were already half a kilometer apart and that would result in reduced service for the people that live in the area that I represent. And finally, the section of the LRT that is west of Highway 427 has not been contentious. It is the section between 427 and somewhere between um, Royal York and Scarlet that is the, the matter of discussion. That latter portion, which is a very large part that was in the original tunneling calculation, has been deemed by the community as something that is not an issue because it runs along the side of the 401. But I want to take, uh, take us back to a dark and stormy night about a month ago. And that was the, um, the first uh, consultation that I went to with some of the community stakeholders. It literally was a dark and stormy night. And that's where we arrived and we were told for the first time by staff that, you know, we've done some calculations, the city's done some calculations, and we figured out how much it cost to do these grade separations that were asked in this report for us to look at. And then we figured out what your time is worth and we recommend against it because they cost too much and your time's not worth that much. But you can imagine the look on the face of everyone in the room. People were very, very frustrated. And then they, got, they saw something that looked like this, which was a, <clears throat> a photo of a grade separation. I guess the initial reaction was, like, there's a whole bunch of cars. All the cars haven't been drawn in here. Like, this is like uh, 6 a.m. on a Sunday morning. What we actually know is what's shown on our own very own web page. This is something more like what Eglinton is all about today. And you understand why people are really, really worried about this. This promises, and it says it right in the report, to disrupt significantly the traffic on Eglinton. And it is an important street in the neighborhood. It's not the only one, but why is that even a bigger issue? And I think they're going to take issue to some of the councillors here that had said, well, well, you know, build this, and then people can take transit and go elsewhere. 
Well, I explained this in the executive committee. This is the intersection of Highway 401, 427. And essentially what you get are these highways that empty out onto an off-ramp onto Eglinton Avenue. And Eglinton Avenue was originally thought to be an expressway, but it was never built that way. Guess what? Today it behaves like that. All of these cars exit these highway ramps, and they begin to distribute along this spine of Eglinton. And they go outwards into the neighborhood. And this is the cars distributing through the, the network of our hierarchy of roads. This highway system doesn't connect you to the block away. It connects you to, to destinations in the GTA, to Oakville, to Brampton, to Hamilton, to Burlington, and places farther and beyond. So by simply saying, uh, you know, just take transit, well, well this will give you a great alternative. Well, I'm sorry, the Eglinton LRT doesn't run to Oakville or wherever somebody is going to be working that day. All this is is a gateway for people to, come, to go to and come away from destinations in the GTA and get back to their homes in this neighborhood using the hierarchy of streets. I think the, uh, the members of the public are very, very upset about this. At that dark and stormy meeting, we began to ask questions, myself included, about, you know, how did you make these calculations? How did you determine the value of our time? How did the traffic modeling work? And we kind of got these very short answers of, well, trust us, we have this algorithm over at Metrolinx and we work with our consultants. Essentially, it was a black box. The members of the community, who are very smart professionals, objected to this and said, well, we want to see the detail. We don't, we don't believe you, or we think we can add some, some, some ideas to that. So all this motion does is give us an opportunity, this, this working group, is, is to get into those details and perhaps find and see if there's a better way or all of the details have been covered and essentially restore some of the public confidence that has been broken in this process. I think we owe it to them to that. It's a multi-billion dollar project. Let's take a little bit of time just to bring people along with the planning and see if there's some great ideas that might come from that community. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor DiGiorgio. Thank you, Madam, <coughs> Madam Speaker. I will be very brief. I just want to echo the comments of the previous speaker. First of all, I think it's important that notwithstanding what you feel about tunneling on a wide street like Eglinton, I think it's important that we allow the, uh, the opportunity for the residents in that area to have some input and to arrive at a conclusion that is likely to be uh, the right conclusion once everybody has some input. Uh, I personally have uh, had a number of occasions to work with uh, Metrolinx and I find that uh, they're very good to work with. I think they're doing excellent work not only on uh, the Eglinton LR, uh, LRT but on, on some of the rail lines that are being proposed to be widened and then uh, electrified, uh, uh, electrifying of trains. There's been all sorts of meetings that have occurred in my area that create some some problems for for residents but the nature of the consultation and the uh, the quality of the consultation that has been going on leads me to um, to support what Metrolinx is doing and I think um, hopefully everybody will be uh, happy with what happens on on Eglinton in the long term thank you thank you Okay, so that's it for the speakers. Mayor Tory, last. Well, Madam Speaker, thank you. And uh, I, I want to thank all the members of council who have participated in the debate today. I have no motions, uh, but I do want to just comment on some of the motions that are before us. Um, I will be supporting uh, Councillor Karagiannis' motion because I think it's fair to uh, examine opportunities to uh, see about what uh, parking or options are. I will be supporting uh, Councillor Perk's motion with respect to updating uh, the funding and financing options for the city for smart track again i would say in commenting on that um, I, I take a much more optimistic attitude based on just the facts in terms of what is included in our 10-year plan now with respect to both uh, smart track and our obligations in that regard uh, on the stations and also at the eglinton west lrt for that matter in its present uh, proposed uh, form but having said that i'm quite happy to see those numbers uh, updated i'll be supporting councillor bylaw's recommendation because i think it is a sensible time for us to look at you know, while we're at uh, doing design work on St. Clair Old Weston Smart Track Station to look at how we can integrate some of these things together. Uh, I'll be supporting Councillor Davis's motion with respect to updating ridership projections in the second uh, quarter of uh, the 2018 report. 
uh, and supporting her motion with respect to the use of city staff, and finally supporting uh, Councillor Palacio's uh, amendment uh, to uh, motion six. What I will not be supporting um, is motions that seek to remove uh, what I think is, notwithstanding some of the comments I've heard here today, uh, to, to, uh, to support the examination of uh, uh, op options, uh, grade separation or tunneling in, with respect to the Eglinton West LRT. It is not, as some people have suggested, a detour or a delay. It is work that can be done uh, and uh, should be done, I think, in response to, uh, there's no point in going out and having public consultation if you then pay absolutely no attention to what you've heard and at least then express a willingness to uh, consult with people uh, in that regard. And so in that sense, I have no trouble at all. In fact, I support it at executive committee. I might have even moved it. Uh, and I support here uh, the notion that we will do that work. It will not be a delay. It will be responsive to the people that we represent, all of us collectively, especially some of my colleagues uh, from uh, Etobicoke. I want to just address myself for a minute to SmartTrack, and I did this morning uh, with the media, but I think it's important to repeat this. The GO train corridors through the City of Toronto, and there are those who insist every day just about in playing politics with this, but the GO train corridors through the City of Toronto were used almost exclusively before my arrival to office to transport people from the 905 into the city and back out again at the end of the day. There was very little use of those corridors, strategically located as they are through the city, to move people inside the City of Toronto. So Smart Track was put forward, and admittedly it was put forward without a lot of expert advice and engineers and all those kinds of things that you don't have access to during an election campaign, but it was put together on the foundation of the GO uh, RER uh, undertaking that the province had announced. And frankly, Smart Track would be difficult to do if they weren't doing the electrification on the rest of the lines and, and whatnot. And, and I will be the first to admit as well that since its original concept, especially in the context of the western part of it, based on some of the uh, information that came back to us once we had those experts employed, um, Smart Track is not exactly the same as it was put forward. But what is a reality is this. When it is done, and I'm not saying if it is done, when it is done, because I'm confident it's going to pass through each of the stage gates, of which this is another one, when it is done, um, it will provide 24 stations along its uh, route it will provide transit that did not exist in the City of Toronto before. It will provide an option that will move people around this city that didn't exist before and frankly wasn't even in the contemplation in any realistic manner of any previous City Council. It's been talked about, but the difference here is we're actually settling down as a Council and with lots of support around this chamber to move it forward and to do it. And yes, uh, to, I say through you, Madam Speaker, to Councillor Perks respectfully, to finance it. It's going to get done. And it's going to get done sooner than many of these other projects, not because we placed it ahead or behind anything on the list, but because uh, the time that it's taken to get Smart Track done and operating is just going to be less given the nature of the fact you don't have to dig and you don't have to do this and you don't have to do that and a large portion of the tracks are already in place. And so I say again, as I've said with respect to other projects, that people want us to move forward. And they want us to move forward in a reasonable, responsible way as we are doing. And you've heard me say today that some of these motions moved to update on various things. I'm very happy to see those kinds of things updated. That's what we should be doing here. But on the principle of whether Smart Track is going to move forward, whether it should move forward, whether it is something that is going to add materially to the transit options available to move people through this city using infrastructure that's been there in many cases for a long time, I say it's time to get on with it. It's time to build Smart Track. It's time to be positive, to vote for it. Uh, because I think it is something that's not, somebody said, use the expression legacy project earlier. You know who it's a legacy for? For this city council to actually stop with the pattern of kind of debating and re-debating and re-deciding and maybe doing one project at a time or maybe no projects at all and actually move forward with one. In fact, an entire network plan that we've put forward and approved as a council and actually this time show we're capable of doing it. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Mamalidi, question to the mayor. Yeah, and it, it really is, you know, my comments about legacy, I, I truly believe that, and, and I, I say that with the utmost respect to you, Mr. Mayor. But, you know, I, as I'm standing up here, uh, thinking that, that the voice of, of some, some in Scarborough needs to be heard as well. And, and some of them there are saying to some of us that uh, it wasn't until this plan of yours was born that the the original plan for the subway out there was next, uh, and and there's a frustration there uh, that 
that I think needs to be addressed. And I guess the question to you is, how do you address that to those that were waiting for the Scarborough, and sub, uh, uh, Scarborough subway, and, and, and because of this particular project, they're not getting it? At least not the way they want. Well, first of all, I don't make the connection you make respectfully through Madam Speaker to the Councillor. I don't make the connection you make that because Smart Track is in existence, somehow some other project has been changed or will not happen at all. I would say to you that what we have for the first time ever, and that people in Scarborough should take great heart from this, we have a Scarborough Network Transit Plan. And it consists, yes, of Smart Track, which is going to provide new stations and new transit service uh, using GO train tracks. Uh, for the people of Scarborough, significant new stations <coughs> at Finch and Kennedy and Lawrence and Kennedy. It is going to provide for an LRT on Eglinton Avenue East, which is going to serve uh, the uh, U of T Scarborough campus and eventually will serve uh, the Malvern community, and that is going to proceed ahead. And uh, finally, you have the Bloor Danforth subway extension, which I stand behind. I notice uh, with interest that, again, the political consensus is going to recreate itself and represent itself to the people, in that you have Mr. Brown now not only saying that he would commit himself and has committed himself to the Scarborough subway, but he will pick up our share of the cost if he becomes the Premier of Ontario. Okay. And so I just say people in Scarborough are getting a so lot more transit than they have today and a lot more than they were going to get when they had the previous uh, subway or LRT standing alone. They didn't have the LRT with the subway and they didn't have well, SmartTrack, so they're going to have a lot well, more transit. Well, before SmartTrack, they were getting a subway and there were, there were many more stops along that subway and they were happy with that. In fact, Scarborough was ecstatic that they were getting what, they, what, what they've been long waiting for. And, and it wasn't until this particular plan that, that that other plan was next. There's only one stop. And now we're about to venture into spending three or four billion dollars for that one stop. Are, are you saying that, that that part of the equation isn't going to surface at one point or another if it isn't Councillor Perks or Councillor Matlow that's going to bring up the cost for one stop later and that might be nixed as well because of this? I am saying through you, Madam Speaker, uh, to the Councillor that uh, what is going to happen is that uh, we are going to be, end up being better off than we are today with respect to the financing of the Bloor Danforth subway extension into Scarborough uh, because we have already one of the political parties uh, from the election to come that has indicated they're going to do better for the City of Toronto in that regard and I suspect others will follow and we will be better off than we are today. I don't know exactly where we'll end up but I'll also say this. We are going to end up with the Scarborough Network Transit Plan, the subway extension, the LRT, and Smart Track, with Scarborough having a lot more transit serving that part of the city, whereas today they have no higher order transit at all, and that that, and in particular, the Bloor Danforth subway extension will be a magnet for jobs and investment for Scarborough. <coughs> they need jobs out there. We want jobs out there. There have been no buildings, commercial buildings built out there for a long time, and there haven't been an adequate number of residential buildings built out there so that people can live and work in Scarborough and not feel they have to come downtown. And this transit uh, plan, the network transit plan for Scarborough, is going to deliver that transit for them to make sure that they can be equal players in the City of Toronto for jobs and investment. And, and what would you say to those in Etobicoke that, that had been treated like a volleyball uh, for the last 25 years or so with respect, to, uh, with respect to Eglinton Avenue? They finally got a commitment by, uh, by the previous uh, administration and the one before that to tunnel along Eglinton Avenue. And now, for the first time in a number of years, they're hearing yet again that they're not going to get the tunneling and they've got to settle with an above ground LRT. And it just seems to be at the same time that we're approving the billions of dollars that are going to go into this new line, that the rest of the city isn't getting what they want in the, in the way of fair transportation. Well, Madam Speaker, I would say to the member, I'd say to the member, he's barking at the wrong tree here, up the wrong tree here, because I am the one who stood here, who at the executive committee moved the motion to look at tunneling. So in that sense, when you're saying somehow that something I'm doing is, is taking tunneling away, the tunneling was never there, but I'm at least prepared to look at it based on what the people said. And I'm standing next to, Madam Speaker, the man who says, please don't give us an LRT on Finch Avenue. And that's transit for Etobicoke as well, for North Etobicoke we and going to Humber College. Yeah, we so at the end of the day, uh, we're building, or the Metrolinx is building with our support, uh, the f transit line along Finch, and we're looking at tunneling along Eglinton. So you should be a happy man, I would say, to, yeah. to the member, Madam Speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Count, Count, Councillor, oh, Councillor Matlow, question. Madam, uh, Madam Speaker to the Mayor. 
during the last election, you promised, uh, along with uh, countless debates and on lawn signs, something called Smart Track. You said it was going to have 22 stations. You promised consistently that it would be built in seven years. You promised consistently that it would be fully funded by TIF. When your opponents even questioned the, uh, the logic of heavy rail on the Western Spur, you derided them and you told them that they were Debbie Downers. And just like you said today, just be positive, don't be a Debbie Downer, just be positive and believe me. You've also consistently voted and spoken against any, any option to look at facts when considering the Scarborough subway. Why should people in Etobicoke or Scarborough believe you today when you say that this is a good plan for them and when you say that this is going to be fully funded and when you say, for example, that we should move ahead with Lawrence East even though the evidence suggests that it needs to be reviewed? Why should anyone believe anything you Councilor say? Councilor Mallow, allow the mayor to answer the question. Well, no, I, I, I'm happy you should go on. Yeah. Madam Speaker, are, are you, is that your question? Yes, it is. Okay, well, I thank you for the question through you, Madam Speaker. Um, I very much regret the fact that you have to sort of imply that somehow I'm not telling the truth or that I'm trying to mislead people. That's very unfortunate and not really necessary. And frankly, I think in some other places, uh, that kind of thing would probably be ruled out of order. But having said that, um, I would just say to you, I stood here not five minutes ago and said through you, Madam Speaker, that Smart Track is not in exactly the form that it was presented. I said that. I acknowledge that. But what I also said, and in fact you're right, there's not going to be 22 stations. When you add in the stations with the LRT as presently proposed, it's going to be 24. There'll be 24 stations on Smart Track, so it'll be two more than we talked about. And I would say another thing, that the Scarborough Network Transit Plan, which we have put together and, and approved as a council, that includes the Scarborough Danforth, uh, Bloor Danforth subway extension, the LRT, and Smart Track actually will add more transit stations, because I, I didn't count them up, but more new transit stations, plus the ones that are being added for Smart Track, than probably has been done by any administration in the history of the City of Toronto. And that is because, unlike previous councils, we haven't focused on one project at a time. We have actually developed and approved the council. I know it's difficult, I say, Madam Speaker, to the member to understand that the majority of the council, on repeated occasions, has approved the transit plans that we're here debating today. Smart Track, the Scarborough uh, LRT, and so on, the Scarborough um, uh, Danforth subway, subway extension. But the fact is, that's what's happened. And we will keep having the votes as necessary. We'll have a couple of more that are really Trojan horses for the same thing, but at the end of the day, I am heartened by the fact that all three levels of government, all three, that all three political parties at the provincial level, that a majority of this council, every elected representative from Scarborough, save and except one, have actually gone along with and supported the network transit plan for Scarborough that is put forward here and indeed the priority list that we put forward for the City of Toronto to get, by the way, the billions of dollars in funding that I have led the charge to go and get. I haven't done it alone, but I've certainly been the leader in doing it, which again, was something that was not done under previous administrations. So I will say to the member, through you, Madam Speaker, I'm proud of what this council has done so far. It is going to lead to incredible improvements in transit in the city in our lifetime for a change, and it's going to lead to thousands upon thousands of jobs to be created in places like Scarborough, and I'm not going to play political games with this. I'm just going to move forward with the majority of this council, with the other parties, and with the other governments to build transit, which is why I was sent here. And we should believe you now the same way that you asked Toronto to believe you during the election when you said that we would have 22 stops. Councillor Matlow, the mayor has years, answered that question. And that it would be fully funded by TIF. The same way when, and I mean, speaking of Scarborough, you mentioned it. You mentioned it. Councillor Matlow. If, if, uh, if, 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 if Council. Councillor Matlow, please. You've asked that question and the mayor has answered. So do you have a new question? Uh, because you only have 30 seconds. So if, if council was asked, this is a, you know, for tomorrow's debate, but if council was asked with respect to the network that you're referring to, to simply look at the facts, you, you acknowledged that you didn't have access to a lot of the facts when you promised the smart track version that you came out with. So if we ask that there be access to the facts about the one-stop subway proposal and the approved seven-stop RT as part of the master agreement, and we compare apples to apples, would you support looking at the facts before the expenditure of billions of dollars on transit? 
I would say, uh, through you, Madam Speaker, to the member that uh, we have looked at lots of facts and will continue to look at lots more. And I indicated a willingness today on Smart Track to look at uh, things that need to be revised and updated. Uh, but again, I very much regret the fact that he chooses to stand up here and, uh, in effect, Im impugn my uh, credibility and say that I somehow have, have told lies to the people of Ontario. You came, yeah, you, no, no, you, you, you just used every now, word. Councillor Matlow, your time word, is up. Please allow word. the mayor no, to no, speak. I guess I was actually just answering, Madam yeah. Speaker, before he interrupted me. No, no, I know you used every word except that, which is really unfortunate. That's the style of politics that I don't believe should happen in this chamber anymore. It's the style, actually, which most people in this chamber don't follow anymore. But if you wish to be the exception, so be it, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Matlow, your time was up. Councillor Lane? Thank you very much. I wasn't going to ask questions because actually there's a good portion of, uh, of the notion of, 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 of Smart Track, of RER, that I, I think I see some agreement with. Um, its execution, I think, will look quite different than, again, what you have uh, had proposed in the election. But what I do and what, what was causing me to, to stand here is a comment that you just made that no other administration before you has worked with the provincial government to... to oh, I did say that. I, I, I believe if we run some of the tape back, n no other council has. And if that, if that isn't what you meant, I, 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 just, I think we should clarify, because e even in the last city council, although I wasn't part of the administration, I know that some of my colleagues here were, and they in fact did their best to attract some money. I know for a fact when I was in a city council that the, the Miller administration did quite well in getting some money, although some of it was retracted. I'll, 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 give, uh, I'll give the Liberal government of the time that, that they took some of it back. Um, but at least I just wanted to make sure we clarify that other governments, have, administrations have worked towards trying to get that money. So, Madam Speaker, certainly I'll say to the member what I meant to say, and I think I did, but having said that, there's no point in reviewing the tape because I'll clarify right now that I don't think there's any administration that has done more, and that includes in particular the uh, bringing in on a, on, a, uh, on a consistent, I'll call it permanent basis, I hope it's permanent, of the Government of Canada uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the funding of transit going forward. And I will acknowledge, standing right here now, uh, that, for example, the subway we're about to open in 10 days' time uh, is a subway that was uh, funded by all three governments, but that was a project of uh, Mayor David Miller and Premier Dalton McGuinty, and that that wouldn't have happened were it not for that council and that mayor and that premier, um, and the same with the fact that there was some federal funding. The problem with a lot of the funding in those days gone by was it was episodic funding on a project-by-project -project basis, as opposed to where we've moved now, certainly federally, and you know that the effort I was spending this past summer, and it's not concluded yet, was to get the province onto the same footing, where instead of once in a while there would be a project announced that they would fund, they get into a consistent funding that ideally would be very much related to the federal funding so we would know and be able to plan on the basis that both those governments would participate. But I certainly didn't mean to imply this was the only council. I don't think I said that, but certainly there's no council that's done more, including in particular attracting billions of dollars from the federal government. And I also said very clearly I didn't do it alone, but I was certainly the leader in in the charge and probably had more meetings with more people about it right from the Prime Minister all the way through than anybody else. I, I, just, I just wanted to make sure that clarification was there. The councils before this have made inroads in attracting funding from other levels of government and in fact some base funding outside of single projects. But just, just with that clarification, thank you, Mr. Thank you. Councillor Peruzza. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, my, my question was essentially asked by, uh, by, by Councillor Layton. Uh, I often uh, sit here and listen uh, to our mayor talk about uh, how this conversation on transit has just been going on for far too long and not much has gotten done. And my, my question to him was simply going to be, on the 15th of December, uh, the, the, they're going to be opening a new uh, you know, subway that actually g runs from, uh, you know, the current Downsview station all the way to the Vaughan Corporate Center. That's a very significant project that actually got built and it, it isn't just being talked about. Correct? Madam Speaker, yes, it's correct, but I will add just one thing because I think it's very important to be honest and complete about this. Uh, the second day, the day after I was elected as mayor, so I hadn't even taken office yet, I paid a courtesy call on Andy Byford, the chief executive officer of the TTC. And he told me on that day that that project was in such a state of fiasco that the likelihood was it was going to cost, I think, upwards of a billion dollars to finish it, and it would, maybe would be finished in 2019. 
So under this administration, with the support of this council and the chair of the TTC, and under the leadership of the CEO of the TTC, we actually fashioned a plan which was debated here, and it was somewhat controversial, uh, to bring somebody in and take the management of that project out of the hands of those who are managing it, make some personnel changes at the TTC, and move forward so that we could, in 2017, not 2019, be uh, opening that subway, which was initiated by Mayor David Miller and Premier Dalton McGuinty and Prime Minister... Who was it? Paul Martin? Uh, and so, yes, uh, yes, yes, that, that was done, and, uh, but it was certainly in a sorry state uh, the day after I got elected. And you often, often say that we're just simply talking about a transit project and transit expansion and not getting on with the work. You will admit that the Eglinton Avenue LRT, a very, very significant transit initiative in this city, is well under construction and was well under construction uh, prior to you getting here. Again, I, I, you've never heard me dispute that for a second. Uh, and and the, in fact, yes, that project through you, Madam Speaker, is under construction. Again, it was a project, I guess, that was approved in terms of its financing under the administrations of uh, Mayor David Miller and, I guess, Mayor Ford, and also uh, uh, Premier Dalton McGuinty again. And so, yes, that's happening. But the bottom line is this, you're, you're kind of going down the road, I say through you, Madam Speaker, where you want to say, let's congratulate ourselves on how great those projects were and maybe sit no. back and say we don't have to do anything more. I'm talking about what we do after and what wasn't happening, what wasn't happening at the time those two great projects, the TYSSE subway that will open in a couple of weeks and the Eglinton West uh, uh, Crosstown, <laughs> what was not happening was the planning in any meaningful way. Even the relief line, much talked about in this chamber, Madam Speaker, as the, the pre preeminent uh, transit project, had not proceeded as far as it has now, uh, thanks to the fact that the Government of Ontario, the current government under Premier Wynne, is putting $150 million into it, and that we put it as a council on our priority list so that uh, when the federal money came, we were able to say to them, because it was a condition of getting the federal money, billions of dollars, we didn't have before, that the relief line was one of the projects that would be funded by that money. So what I'm saying is when I got here, along with some others, we had those two projects underway and full marks to David Miller and to Rob Ford and to Dalton McGinty and anybody else that deserves credit, Paul Martin, but the number of things that were on the books uh, that were planned to go forward were a lot less than is the case today because you now have, which you didn't have before, Smart Track, you have the Eglinton East LRT, which is moving, going to move forward, you have the Eglinton West LRT, which is going to move forward, you have uh, the priority list that, that we've gone through, um, and the Scarborough uh, trans Transit Extension, which was a, the subject of endless and exhaustive debates before I got here, and for some reason continues to be the subject of exhaustive, endless debates now, even though it's been voted on here, I believe, nine times. So you often say that, uh, you know, we're, we're always talking about uh, these projects and we need to get on with the work and the rest of it. Uh, you will admit that even though we haven't done a heck of a lot on it, except it's slowed down a little bit, you will admit that the Finch Avenue West LRT running from Keel Street to Humber, uh, to Humber College uh, is uh, significantly underway. It's a major initiative uh, that was started by the City Council, has now been taken over by Metrolinx, but it's rolling along. Slowly but surely, it's a project without our intervention or input is getting done. You will admit that. I wouldn't exactly describe it as rolling along, and I would say that I have members such as the one uh, sitting to my right uh, in many name. different respects. Giorgio uh, the name. Councillor Giorgio Mammoliti. Uh, who uh, think we should stop it and, and put it in mothballs. But I would say to you that, again, I'll repeat what the problem was through you, Madam Speaker, which was that, yes, those programs won their books for a long time, and they, they were for years, nothing was happening with them. And so, yes, now they're proceeding. Crosstown, going ahead, tick mark. Eglinton, uh, at least Finch Avenue, tick mark, not rolling along, I wouldn't say, but at least it's creaking uh, maybe into some sense of action. And finally, uh, the, uh, the uh, York University subway. But the problem was there wasn't a roadmap as to where we were going from, from there. There was a lot of talk, and now we've got a lot of projects to the point where uh, my friend, I say through you, Madam Speaker, Councillor Perks, is worried we have too many transit projects. Well, I'll tell you something. I don't think there's any such thing at, in the life of this city at this time, given the people who are moving here, the growth we're approving seemingly without difficulty, there's no such thing as too much transit. We do have some challenges that, on how we're going to pay for it, but there's no such thing as too much transit in a city that took decades off doing its job and building the transit it should have built for people who are going to work and going to school today. Thank you.
Okay, let's vote. Our first motion is motion number five by Councillor Cressy. Yes. Recorded vote. Councillor Matlow, please, and thank you. Councillor Peruzza. Councillor Mahevic, Councillor Troisi, please. Councillor Mahevic, please. The amendment does not carry. The vote is 14 to 28. Our next motion is motion number one by Councillor Ford. Recorded vote. Councillor Peruzza, please. Councillor Layton. Councillor Pasternak, please. <laughs> Councillor Peruzza, your vote, please. The motion does not carry. The vote is 6 to 36. Motion 4 by Councillor Carroll, recorded vote. Councillor Pruitt, so please. Councillor McMahon. Councillor Crawford, please. <laughs> the motion does not carry. The vote is 12 to 30. Motion number eight by Councillor Palacio. Recorded vote. <laughs> Councillor Perks, please. Councillor Davis, Councillor Carroll, and Councillor Peruzza. Motion eight carries 38 to four. Motion six as amended by Councillor Baila. Recorded vote. Councillor Wong Tam, please. The motion is amended, carries 40 to 2. Motion 2 by Councillor Kergianis. Recorded vote. Councillor Layton, please. Councillor Montan, Councillor Pasternak. Councillor Mahavik, please.
The motion carries 38 to 4. Motion 3 by Councillor Perks. Recorded vote. Councillor Karagiannis, please. Councillor Layton and Councillor Peruzza. Motion three carries unanimously, 42 in favor. Councillor, Councillor Perks, congratulations. <laughs> Our next motion is 7A by Councillor Davis. Recorded vote. <laughs> Councillor Peruzza, please. Councillor Cole and Councillor Mahavik, please. The motion carries unanimously, 42 in favor. Motion 7B by Councillor Davis. Let's see if the, it's going to be a landslide here. Recorded vote. Councillor Bailao, thank you. Councillor Mahavik, please. The motion carries 41 to 1. Oh. Oh. My item is amended, recorded vote. Well, we were hoping. Councilor Mahavik, please. The item is amended carries 36 to 6. Okay, our next, oh, Councillor Cressy. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Just very briefly on a point of privilege, I wanted to acknowledge that we do have a new extended member of our council family. Uh, that is Chloe Juniper Layton. Uh, and so just a huge congratulations to Councillor Layton and his fabulous partner, Brett, on the board for their job. Our next item is on page four, EX 29.2, the Rail Deck Park. Um, we're also going to deal with um, item T 28.7, Toronto and East York uh, Council item as well at the same time. So do we have any questions uh, to staff? Councillor Cressy. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I'll begin by directing questions to, the, uh, to our chief planner. Um, as part of this report, have you identified the area around a ra the rail corridor as one in need of parkland, that is parkland deficient? That's correct. The area of the downtown is currently park deficient in, as it compares to the rest of the City of Toronto. Is it the most parkland deficient area in the City of Toronto? One of, one of many. The, the growth areas are under significant pressure. Young and Eglinton downtown are among, among the most park sufficient areas. Downtown currently has a parks provision of 10.8. Uh, square meters per resident, which compares to a city, uh, city-wide average of 28 square meters. All right. Uh, from a city-wide point of view, 
Um, can I ask, have there been similar projects undertaken in other cities that have derived citywide benefit from their completion? Well, certainly uh, you, we've seen in major American cities and in Australia uh, the use of creating a new uh, signature public space as a new way of reimagining the way that city uh, is experienced. In, uh, in, in uh, Chicago and many of, uh, through, the, through the speaker, many people have probably seen Millennium Park which is a large, uh, comparatively sized park installation uh, on the waterfront. It currently is uh, Chicago's number one tourist attraction, attracted uh, almost 13 million people in the last uh, part of 2016. Uh, the, another example of using parks as a, as a driver for economic development and tourism is the High Line in New York City. Again, a, a new park space which is bringing significant tourism, more tourism in fact, as a facility than the Empire State Building or, uh, or the Statue of Liberty. And, and so, separate from the issue of parkland deficiency and meeting a need, do you see the possibility for Rail Deck Park as similar to Millennium Park and the High Line in New York City as an opportunity for citywide benefit in, as a citywide destination? I would say it's an opportunity in the broadest sense of the word. It's an opportunity to address the parkland deficiency. It's also an opportunity to build up and reimagine the, the signature brand of the city. Thank you. Uh, to our Deputy City Manager, Mr. Livy, there's been a lot of conversation related to ownership as it relates to the air rights as well as the land around the rail corridor. Uh, through this process, did staff undertake a title search? And if so, what are the conclusions as of the publication of this report? Madam Speaker, yes, uh, staff undertook a, st a title search and constantly looks at the registrations. There are four owners of the land. There's the Toronto Terminal Railways, CN, the City of Toronto and Metrolinx. And uh, so that is the owners of the land and we're aware of a company that has applied for an official plan amendment called PITS or Craft, the Orchid Development, who uh, are, are an agent for those owners, for the uh, TTR. So, but just so I understand, we have identified four owners of the air rights being the City of Toronto, Metrolinx and CN and TTR. Those are the only four. They are the only four, that's right. Uh, from the context of acquisition, is one of the recommendations in this report subject to Council's approval to then proceed with acquiring the air rights from those three other owners? Madam Speaker, that's correct. We would have to acquire the air rights from the owner, uh, whoever it is, whether it's... Now, on a value for money uh, assessment here, what is the going rate of one acre of land in downtown Toronto right now? Well, the, the, there's, a number of, there's a number quoted in the report, I believe it's 95 to $110 million, but we've got examples of recent transaction at 154, 268, 77 and $78 million. So it's and, and so would it be viable for the city to acquire 21 individual lots at one acre in size? And if so, would that be more or less expensive than acquiring the air rights above this corridor? Madam, Madam Speaker, be both more expensive, I believe, and also more complicated and more protracted, and it would be difficult then to acquire a consolidated uh, piece of land that would represent a regional, citywide, national park uh, of and this kind. On that basis, do you see this as the last remaining opportunity in downtown Toronto for a park of this size? Madam Speaker, that would be the this is the last real opportunity for a major park, yes. Now, on the funding question, you have spoken often, and I've heard you, about growth paying for growth. It's alluded to in the report. As part of the Section 42 park acquisition funds, do I understand correctly that when TO Corps comes forward in the spring, you are proposing to bring forward a new Section 42 rate, in essence, to increase the amount we collect as a ward and as a city. Is that correct? Speaker, That's your last question. That is correct. We plan to come forward with a revision to the current uh, scheme that caps uh, the contribution from developers for cash in lieu at 10% of the land area of any particular site. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, the next question is Councillor Robinson. Um, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, or Deputy Speaker. Um, Young and Eglinton, uh, I couldn't help but notice you identify that as a parkland deficient area in the city. Is that accurate and can you expand on that? Yes, uh, Young and Eglinton is one of the city's fastest growing residential and hopefully employment areas. The, uh, the, the work that we've done with Midtown Focus, which is also on the agenda, uh, Madam Speaker, Madam yes. Deputy Speaker, 
uh, identifies parkland deficiency issues, among other infrastructure issues. There is a parkland uh, and public realm plan that's been already put through council, and we're updating that through the Midtown Focus exercise. And we would be bringing forward uh, strategy in the new year with the secondary plan to increase the funding rate in, in Young and Eglinton to support the implementation of that parkland strategy. So you, you agree that it's an unprecedented level of intensification happening at Young and Eglinton and the fastest growing area in the city? It's among them, yes. Among them. Um, one of the things a, a number of residents and parents would have liked to have seen is 1830 Erskine, beside John Fisher School, been purchased as parkland. That couldn't happen for a number of reasons. Very disappointing. But um, I guess they look down to the downtown core and what potentially may happen there and say they're, they're very fortunate. So I guess my question is, will this in any way impact Young and Eglinton in, in securing green space, public realm, streetscape improvements, et cetera? No, the, in, the intent is that the uh, 42 rate, the, the rate that the city takes uh, parkland levies uh, in association with development will be increased in all, <clears throat> excuse me, in all growth areas to support the achievement of parks to support the uh, redevelopment that's happening in all of the growth areas. So uh, I think what you're saying to me is if this goes forward, it in no way affects Young and Eglinton and that there will be parkland purchased there because literally there is, I like to say, not a blade of grass um, and it's getting worse and buildings are coming down and taller ones going up, dust everywhere. Um, very hard to even really live in that area currently. So you're saying this will in no way impact this part of the city, which is also really uh, desperate for green space and parkland. That's, that's correct, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's intended to be the same kind of strategy for Young and Eglinton. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Robinson. Uh, Councillor Mamaliti. Sorry about that. I was just uh, resetting your timer. Very important. Uh, leave it up to you. <laughs> I'd like to know the cost, the total cost of this venture. So, Madam Speaker, uh, we've done a detailed engineering analysis, uh, and the cost uh, order of magnitude is one billion six hundred sixty-five million. And the original estimate was what? Madam Speaker, there was no original estimate in the last report. We did not uh, stipulate a dollar amount. Okay, so uh, assuming that this thing could be built, uh, what, in 10 years, 15 years? Madam Speaker, it could be built in phases and it could be built earlier. The first uh, likely phase that we'd like to see advance would be the top of the Spadina Front Metrolink subway or uh, uh, smart, track, smart track station or, or tra how uh, soon go station. How soon would that be? Uh, that could reasonably start in three years. So what would the cost of the venture be in three or four years, assuming that it goes an extra year on uh, that? And then I'm assuming the rest of it will take up to 10 or 15 years. What are the costs uh, associated to the full park at that point? So we've, we've identified in the report a first phase, which would include the Metrolink station and the lands to the south, right down to Northern Linear Park. That cost, phase one cost, would be $872 million unescalated. So that would bring it up to over $2, $2 billion? Uh, no, Madam Speaker, that is included in the 1.665. 1 and, and what happens if the estimates are wrong? What happens if I'm right and this thing's going to cost about $3 billion at the end of the day? Madam Speaker, we've taken extreme pains to look at the costing. You'll see in the report that the deck construction itself is $844 million. The park construction to do the landscaping says $95 million. Design fees at 95, million. but we have two amounts, a contingency of $327 million and an allowance of $304 million for a total of $631 million, basically in contingencies and allowances, which we think is sufficient to cover off the risk of any cost escalation. Okay, so uh, given that, uh, how, I remember when this came forward, I moved a motion that passed through Council that asked for all of us to be upgrade, up, uh, updated on upgrading uh, uh, those parks necessary that were insufficient in, in playgrounds and that sort of thing. Where is that list for us to take a look at? So, Madam Speaker, we've uh, come back with a report that includes in recommendation 
3A and 3B principles for funding, which would see that the existing policy and allocations that benefits all parts of the city would remain untouched, and that any future no, no, uh, increases in parkland levies yeah. would be distributed accordingly, and all parts of the city no, would no, benefit I get that. from that change. I, I get that. I'm, I've asked for a very detailed list and the passed through council, along with this report. Uh, in a uh, separate report? That asked, yes, that asked for each one of our parks in our own wards uh, and, uh, to, be, to be looked at and given us uh, the evaluations based on how uh, insufficient some of them are uh, so that we get an idea of whether or not we should be supporting the, at this point anyway, it sounds like over $2 billion uh, in funding and to leave our parks that need their playgrounds and that, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. So, so where, where, where is that list? Because nobody from parks has come to me well, anyway and said, hey, councillor, these parks are, are not up to standard and we should fix them before we spend $2 billion on a new park. So, Madam so, Speaker, I'll turn this over to Janie in just a sec, second, but I wanted to make sure you, we acknowledge that you had that point and we have addressed it and, and Janie can explain it. So three, three, Madam Speaker, I'm, I'm looking at the recommendations from the previous report. Uh, one, requesting an information on deficiencies in parks in the suburbs specifically through your motion. So we did report through at Executive Committee on phase one of an updated parkland strategy that is looking at parkland across the city and we'll be reporting back on the final parkland you envision, review you in you, June. Do you envision all of our parks being upgraded the way they should? before we spend this, these, these few billion dollars on a new park? Through you, Madam Speaker, there's two different uh, items to look at. The first is parkland deficiency vis-a-vis -vis the amount of land we have available for parkland across the city and the equitable distribution Not the parklands. I'm talking about the existing parks, uh, playgrounds, uh, the infrastructure, uh, ball diamonds, all the things that are, are, are not working for our communities. That was your last are, question. Do you see us fixing up all of our parks and our wards with the cap with capital money that, before we venture into spending that was $2 billion. Your last question. Through, through, through you, Madam Speaker, uh, we'll be reporting out on the parkland strategy in June with the final strategy, also with some reference to the funding that's available uh, for the existing parks that we have. Thank you. Councillor DiCiano. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. So my questions uh, relate to essentially how we got here. Um, Acknowledging the fact that there's thousands of residential units uh, in the vicinity of the proposed rail deck park, um, did we not have policies in place uh, during the approval of all those condominiums to uh, um, figure out how we were going to build a sizable park? Because now we, we, I'm hearing that this area is very deficient and it's only going to get worse. Why didn't we know this beforehand? Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, the, uh, the course of uh, the last 10 or 15 years with the growth that's taken place in downtown Toronto, we have had a parkland bylaw in place. Uh, the dynamic of what's been happening is extremely uh, higher densities over that period of time, higher land values. Uh, the site sizes have be, be, uh, been increasingly uh, smaller. So we've taken where we could on-site parkland, but we increasingly turned to taking cash in lieu of parkland. Uh, the ability to keep up in that land market and acquire new, new parks is increasingly challenging. We have created a number of new parks in, in the last 10 or 15 years, but we simply cannot keep up to the rate of growth that's taking place. So part of the strategy that was being considered by the executive committee is to reset the rate and reset the plan through the parkland strategy. So on a go-forward basis, we have a much more um, direct relationship between providing infrastructure and the growth that we're projecting. Well, it sounds amazing. I mean, it, <laughs> I think we're 20 years too late, but uh, so, so then help me understand something. Um, how much land is left in the vicinity? I mean, we can only collect parkland dedication section 37 for certain areas around a community. How much area around this community or around Real Deck Park is available for development um, and what is the estimate that we're going to generate from any additional levies? The, uh, over the next 25 years, uh, through the work that we're doing with the downtown secondary plan, 
we're projecting in the larger downtown from Bathurst to the river, up to the rail tracks to the lake, uh, roughly 140 to 180,000 units, depending on how it plays out over such a long period of time. Uh, through, the, through the development of that range of size of, of uh, pipeline, uh, the projection is a very, uh, with a new rate, a new 42 rate, a fairly robust level of, uh, of parks levies that can pay for uh, a large portion of this facility as well as other uh, parkland improvements that are necessary throughout the downtown. Okay, so that's a pretty uh, big area. Um, are you sure that there aren't going to be communities where thousands of these units are going to be placed saying, I don't want to walk all the way to Rail to Park, I want a park right outside my, my building? I mean, how do we force people in this broad development area to say all oh, your money's going to Rail Duck Park, uh, especially with, with policies and, and I, th I think through you, Madam PPSs. Speaker, there's, there are going to be a number of strategies. We're going to have to re, uh, redo existing parks. We're doing that now with Bursey Park and uh, Barbara Ann Scott Park, for example. We're going to have to uh, continue to acquire small on-site parks, but they will be more like best pocket parks, pocket parks. Uh, we're going to... Uh, have to invest in uh, green connections that make it easy for people to get to, from where they live to where the parks facilities are. Finally, through this analysis, we've really determined this is the only last opportunity to build a large, functional, open space. This, you can fit actually seven smaller parks into this park, seven of the existing parks downtown. Uh, so we think it has a, has a vast kind of functionality and utility for a greater number of people to do a greater number of things. Yeah, no, I, I certainly don't disagree with the notion that uh, it's desperately needed. I'm just concerned that now that the developers have all left that area, uh, taxpayers are left, you know, holding the bag for this park. So do you know what we collected in the last 10, 15 years for a consolidated green space for this area? Um, do we have a number? And how many units that composed of? And are we going to get anywhere close? Because I, I just... I'm not convinced that uh, developments through a broad area of the city are going to just say, yep, no problem, I'll give you a parkland dedication for rail deck or I'll give you my 10% for land allocation to rail deck and, and dollar value and don't worry about the residents that have to walk their dogs or their children. I'm just not convinced that that's going to work. Okay, that was your last question. So through you, Madam Speaker, and, and we did report out on the cash in lieu balances last spring uh, through to Council. So over the last 10 years, the city's collected uh, roughly $483 million in cash in lieu uh, from residential development. And uh, during the same period, we spent roughly $260 million. So you can see the balances and roughly where, where the money has been spent as well. Um, uh, so going forward and, and through uh, working with planning, we are projecting what those balances would be with the uh, residential development that we have in the pipeline. Thank you. Councillor Crisanti. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, so m earlier I heard that there are four registered owners on title. Uh, does that include uh, any claim to air rights as well? So, uh, Madam Speaker, we're aware of an application made by an agent called Pitts. Uh, I believe the, the company is called Kraft. They're called the Orca Development. They've made an application. It's being reviewed by city planning for a uh, development on this uh, rail deck area, which would include a number of uh, condominium towers and a park. Uh, that's what we're aware of. It presumably involves some sort of conditional deal with Toronto Terminal Railroads, railroads but we've not seen the, uh, the nature of that uh, arrangement. And uh, the 600 or just over $600 million in contingencies for design, pricing, construction and, and any other contingencies, would that include any uh, negotiations which of course maybe have, uh, have any negotiations be begun? Maybe I should ask that first with any of these. Uh, Mad Madam Speaker, no, there's been no negotiations uh, uh, with the uh, with that applicant that you that I referred to earlier, nor with TTR, we have made some inquiries with TTR, but we've not been able to advance any to any negotiations. Okay, and you're comfortable that all those costs will be more than covered in what you currently have estimated? Madam Speaker, we have an allowance in our in our uh, uh, in that amount. So, what's the size of the proposed park? Madam Speaker, the proposed park is roughly 21 acres or 6.3 hectares. 
Okay. And um, in terms of, I don't see anywhere in the report that speaks specifically to uh, costs of operating. It's, it's a relatively large park, obviously 21 acres. Right. Costs of operating, uh, we've got to also consider that in any decision I think we make going forward. Uh, what will it cost to maintain a park like that? Do you have any estimates, any idea, even from the point of view of, uh, of uh, policing, given that our police resources are, are so very, very lean today that they're more on a reactive mode in policing and not proactive, uh, how do we cover the cost of, of the additional policing, park wardens maybe, or what do you have in mind? So three, Madam Speaker, the actual design of the components that will be on the park have yet to be determined. So the operating costs will be determined by the actual design of the park. We're also looking at a number of innovative operations models and governance models similar to those that have been pursued to some of the other landmark parks uh, in the U.S., such as Millennium Park and, and the Beltline. So there's a number of different approaches. We don't have an estimate around the operating costs at this point. You know, I understand that, and I, I, that's what I read in the report, uh, uh, but uh, wouldn't it be prudent to maybe make an attempt, given that you already know the size of the park? I know that the design will factor into coming up with more precise costs in terms of how going forward and, and the operating itself, but an estimate, I think, would be wise. You know, that's, that's like, uh, you know, buying a major, buying your own personal property and not knowing what it's going to cost you to operate it. I think you've got to factor that in if we're, if we're going to be building um, a park of this, uh, of this size. And through you, Madam Speaker, that, that will be part of the next phase of evaluation that's done when we report back in the next phase of Rail Deck Park. And the timing for that to come back is? 2019. All right. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Councillor McMahon. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Um, I just wondered if anyone was here from public health? No? Maybe Parks can answer. I just, my question is, um, what is the connection between health and well-being and access to nature? Through you, Madam Speaker, I, I'm not speaking for public health, but there have been many studies and, and research that has been done that connects nature to well-being and certainly parks and leisure time to mental health and well-being. And what, um, you need to get out to a park, <laughs> Mr. Maverick. Um, what is the industry standard for walkability uh, um, factor to green space and Through parks? you, Madam Speaker. Through the initial work that we've done on the parkland strategy phase one, uh, five to ten minutes walkable to green space is a, is a average that we've seen in some other large urban centers that we're focusing on. And we're working on that kind of tally number figure for Toronto, right? That's correct. Okay. And last question, uh, when comparing green space across the city, how does the downtown fare? As through you, Madam Speaker, as Mr. Lintern has noted, the downtown, in particular the study area around Rail Deck Park, proposed Rail Deck Park, is one of the most uh, parkland deficient areas in the city. Thank you. Case closed. Thank you. Councillor Pasternak. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm going to follow up on a, a question I raised at Executive Committee. Uh, when development applications come through my desk, um, the planning staff uh, press hard to do parkland on site, which would then negate cash and loo. Uh, yet the vision here seems to be pushing for cash and loo so we can raise a big pot of money to pay for this project. I sense a disconnect. Uh, between the planning department and the parks department. Am I misreading the situation? Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, actually, uh, we've been working very closely with the uh, parks forestry and recreation over the last couple of years to develop unified strategies to support growth. Uh, we know that 90% of the sites downtown are less than one hectare, and it's increasingly difficult to get uh, parkland on site. Uh, the sites that are uh, under redevelopment in other parts of the city are typically larger and they do afford more opportunities to uh, acquire parkland on site through the development review process. So you do see different types of responses in different parts of the city, often responding to the kind of fabric and parcel fabric you have in those areas. If we are raising the, the amount of revenue through Section 42, how would we uh, rank among cities? Would, would we be um, 
off the chart when it comes to asking developers to pay, or would we pretty well be in the middle of the pack? Where, where would we stand visa via other municipalities? Th through you, Madam Speaker, um, we haven't done that level of detailed analysis, but it would be, uh, uh, I think, correct to assume that given the amount of development and the pace of development, that our collection of cash in lieu is, is probably uh, at s some of the highest in Canada. I think the Deputy City Manager one did a comment. Oh, okay. Sure. I'd, only, I'd only observe that we're well below the standard that's in the Act currently, and I would say we're probably in the middle of, of the pack at maximum, so there's some room to grow the parkland levy. All right, so we won't be off the charts when it comes to uh, a, new, a new fee regimen. No, sir, and, and we've actually been very deliberate in our reporting to want to make sure that we understand that we need to engage the development community in a proactive way. We're setting up mechanisms to do that that would take into account this, development charges and other factors that influence their bottom line. But we also have a bottom line as a city to provide parks like this, and we believe we've got to come to, to an agreement with them on a suitable financing strategy for all of that. So along that line of, of questioning, uh, refresh uh, my memory, for every dollar that we get cash in lieu, uh, a percentage stays local, a percentage stays goes regional, and then a percentage goes citywide. Is that uh, an accurate snapshot? Uh, that's roughly it. Janie can give you the specifics. So through you, Madam, Madam Speaker, that's correct. There is a distribution for every dollar. Uh, half remains local. Half uh, goes into a citywide acquisition plot. And within those pots, it's divided once again uh, evenly between uh, uh, funds available for acquisition and funds available for development. And in your opinion, it, it, uh, well, will the, this carving of the pie stay as is? Or, or, or are we looking at changing the carving of the Through you, Madam Speaker, we are not uh, uh, proposing any changes to that as a principle around uh, divisibility. And, and if that stays as is, can we finance the Real Deck Park? That's, you're splicing up that pie pretty good. Through as you, is. Madam Speaker, we are, we are looking at, uh, and bef before Council will be some changes in, in, as Mr. Lintern has indicated, the cash and lieu processes. So we're not looking at any changes to that base 5% that's currently allocated the way that it is. All right, last, final question. When will this come back to us for, for more dialogue? It comes back uh, uh, through you, Madam Speaker, in 2019, the first part of 2019. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Campbell. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. As I, uh, I, I, I'm very familiar with the downtown area, having gone to the Sky Dome and then the Rogers Centre for years uh, before anything was built out there. And I guess the question to city staff is, and to, to the planning department in particular, it's, a, it's following up on the lines of the Councillor D. Chan put forward. And in 2012, the Globe and Mail site, which was recently demolished and cleared for development, it sold for just $136 million, and it's something like, you know, it's six and a half acres. So that's to the tune of $21 million an acre, and that's just five years ago. Uh, next to it, there was a Toyota dealership. Uh, I don't know the size of that. I don't know the, the I don't know what the final price was, but I, I, I would imagine it, it's it's along those lines. The report says that typical aqu land acquisition costs for free and un uncumbered properties range between 95 and 115 million dollars an acre. So my question is, why hasn't staff in the past been looking for some of these opportunities to buy land at much, much less than the reported cost of land now? A three minute speaker, I would just note with the Globe Mail site, the, uh, the specifics of that development, which did include the Toyota site ultimately, included both a small on-site park and acquisition of off-site park. But, so but, the, the total and, and about 40, I think it was about 45% of the site was um, publicly accessible open space. So the nature of that development afforded a particular opportunity to get a certain kind of open space. And we look for off-site park in that instance to connect to a park system to the north of the site. So, so okay. So Mr. Livy wants to add to that. I'll follow up on that in Sorry. just a second. Okay. <laughs> I've been diligently trying to acquire on a site-by-site -site basis. But we lacked a focus for a large park like this to focus our efforts. In fact, we've fallen behind in actually taking the money that we've collected and translated it into land. And as, and as a result, we've lost that up. We lost that opportunity to buy things at that, those prices. And now we need to make sure that we have a place to 
put our money in a concerted effort. So, well, let me just be clear. I fully support this plan. I, th I, think, it, I think it's brilliant. But when I, look, I, when I look at a site like the Globe and Mail site, right there at, at Front and Spadina, I don't know why the city didn't say, you know what, maybe we should just buy the whole thing up and, and, and convert it into a park. Was that ever, was that, it was, and, and, and I would also like to know if we have an understanding of how much unencumbered land is still down in the downtown core. How many parking lots are there? And are there other opportunities for the city perhaps to look at purchasing land for a reasonable value? Through, through the uh, Parks and Public Realm Plan and the work that we've done with Rail Deck Park, we have looked across the downtown for other uh, large uh, site opportunities for large contiguous parks. Um, frankly, this is the only last large opportunity short of going out and assembling, for example, 20 one-acre sites. How, how would you define large? Is six acres uh, large? Greater, greater than uh, three, uh, three hectares is the definition that we've used in the, in the report. Uh, it, it just provides a greater functionality when you get that large. Is the city looking, it, 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 has the city looked at or looked at possible sites, three to six acres, that might currently be just parking lots downtown? There is, uh, through you, Madam Speaker, there is nothing like that in the okay. city. We have uh, large development sites where we're taking on site park, for example, Lower Young LCBO. There's a large site, a large park coming with that, but it's around two acres at the end of the day. Even for a site like that, that's about the size of park that you end up getting. It's very, very difficult and challenging to assemble that kind of park space. When I, when, I, when I look at the numbers here, it says, okay, the rail deck park is going to cost about $83 million. But if we were to buy land, it's 95 to $115 million. And I'm not seeing, you know, a real big value savings because I know that the $83 million is only going to go in one direction. And, and, while, and while you could make the same case for land prices, uh, I, I think that the accelerator on the rail deck park in terms of, of cost per acre is going to be greater than, than buying land. Madam, Madam Speaker, I disagree. I actually think that the better number is the staff number for the rail deck. Uh, given what we've, we've seen and the way it's constructed, it's not a particularly complicated piece of uh, engineering. And all we see in the land market right now is prices that continue to go up. But more importantly, to get a, this kind of site, this site, this is the site for it. There's no other site. Right. And it's really, you can start negotiating with individual one at a time, months and months and months with difficult people. I, I don't think the prospect of us ever acquiring large is, is with us anymore. Okay, that One last was, question. No, I, that, it, was just at, it was at 4.59. No, 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 sorry. I, I, I want to be fair to everybody, Councillor Campbell, Councillor Carroll. Yeah, I just wanted to sort of um, reorder uh, the, the way we're, we're looking at this. We are looking at both the, the zoning item today and the feasibility study for, for the park that's, that's been proposed. We're, we're asking questions about both right now. So in terms of the, the zoning, uh, this is not unheard of, is it? If you, it, it's not a matter of, of the councillor saying, I would like a big park, and so you look for where to put one. We do want to have some sort of large feature in the downtown core in any case, do we not? Through you, Madam Speaker, this is actually an official plan amendment, just to be clear. Right. Uh, the, the process has been to review the planning framework in the area, which happens to be the, the various railway lands plans that were approved decades ago, and to consider right. the appropriate use of what is now uh, a rail corridor. Uh, somewhat unsightly, but a uh, highly essential rail corridor. And right. the opportunity that it presents in a contextual way, uh, in a way, a great, great opportunity, given the size of it, to, to, uh, to get way ahead of the game that we know we'll never win. We will never win getting right. up to a rate of parkland provision to the rest of the city, but this will go a long way to resetting the amount of parkland that we can supply for residents and workers downtown. Right. And so is it fair then to, get, to, to characterize the, the debate we're about to have is really about, is it not, it's really about planning and visioning versus waiting for, it, versus reacting. We could just wait and application by application, reaction by reaction, we, we'll end up sealing the fate of what happens here. This is about planning in advance what we want to happen there. 
regardless of whether we have the billion dollars in our pocket right now or even the 115 million. Is that not the case? That's, that's the case. We've done a parks and public realm plan through the TR Corps process. We've done a lot of work in the last 15 years, but the plan is to knit it all together. Part of this is creating what we call the stitch, which is bringing together a number of public facilities, tourism assets across the south part of the downtown. This right. is ideally situated that will bring really a, a forecourt to all of those great public facilities and create a seamless connection both north, south and east, west. So it is very much part of a greater vision and a greater plan. Right, and, and so the fact that it's aspirational shouldn't, shouldn't stop us from going ahead with, with, with doing the, the, uh, the, the, the zoning in advance. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't actually picture them, but, but during the meeting and during the presentation, other cities were, were given as an example of having this aspirational planning happen well in advance of execution. Could you name some of those for us now for the, for the benefit of the public that are more likely to see it here today? Well, the, I've already noted the, uh, the examples uh, in Chicago, uh, which is a roughly equivalent size. Chicago has long had a principle of, of creating public access to its waterfront. This generally exists on its waterfront, but it also exists above a rail and road facility. So it's a, it's a very interesting right. example of, of how this is done. There are other cities such as uh, Melbourne that is built over uh, right. facilities yes. in Australia. A smaller example in Dallas, Texas, even building over a over a major highway uh, facility in the downtown. And in, in in both those those two very obvious examples of Melbourne and Chicago, the planning exercise. What we're being asked to look at today was actually a couple of decades before. The community, the residents saw execution. Is that not the case? That's the case. That's the case. The millennium was uh, uh, the idea was gestated in the in the 90s. Right. Right. Thank you. Those are my questions, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Councillor Layton. Questions? Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. It's really just one question. Uh, if we change the Section 42 contribution. Will that, will that, if we increase uh, what, what's required, will that um, result in greater resources for communities across the city? Yes. So more money for parks in Scarborough, more money for parks in Etobicoke, for North York? That is the principle that staff are recommending that will guide the financial strategy to develop the, the cash of, that we would use to develop this park. So that principle wouldn't only support parks growth in the downtown core and specifically city place uh, city Kings Medina, it'll support citywide growth. Citywide strategy, yes. So that communities in Etobicoke, Scarborough, North York, my community just west of this area, uh, will benefit from the development in, in, in the downtown core more. Well, yes. Great, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Kerjianis. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Through you to staff. Um, how many acres will this uh, rail deck be? Approximately 20 acres. Okay, and the estimated cost for us to acquire, not to build, acquire, the rights. Sorry, so could you ask the question again? The cost to acquire the air rights. So, Madam Speaker, I'd be uh, uh, remiss in. Madam uh, Speaker, I. I I'm sorry, but I... Yeah, well, there's nobody behind you talking. Yeah, lots and lots of noise coming from You want to put my... Thank you for putting Yeah, I did. I put your time on hold. Thank you. It is a bit echoey here, Speaker. Um, Councillor Davis. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you. So, so, Madam Speaker, I'm going to, it's going to be a longer answer than I know you're going to want, but I want to make sure Council understands this. We realize we have to acquire the air rights. And the we've cost seen, of that? And, and we've, seen, we've seen other examples, so we know what some other examples look like. I would not advise you any number in front of in the public because ultimately it's a negotiation that we have to have with the owners okay. of the air rights. And so uh, we are knowledgeable. There's, a, there's an allowance in the contingency for this. And uh, so, no, I won't be able to give you a specific number on the floor okay, council in public. Just one sec. 
Councillor Grimes, Councillor Burnside. Kids, stop talking. Okay. Can you please define how we get through through the through the chair to 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 uh, to staff? How did we come up with a figure 1.6 billion? Where's that number been coming from? So, Madam Speaker, attached to the report is a series of reports. One of them is an engineering construction feasibility study. It looked at the, en at the engineering, the practicality of putting uh, active columns in the middle of an active rail line, the cost of the, the structure supports, the, the uh, width and the depth of the uh, uh, spans that go across in the various locations. So it's, I, I commend it to you. It's got some very detailed information. But the 1.6 is acquiring the air rights, building it, and, and uh, opening up the park. That's when it's going to cost us $1.6 billion. Madam, Madam Speaker, again, the construction costs are roughly 844, about half of it. Soft costs are about $100 million, 95, park construction 95, and contingencies and allowance $631 million. So 1.6. 1.665, yes. Okay, so when you take 1.6 to, to, to round it up and you divide that by 21 acres, would I be correct in um, coming up with a number of $76,190,476.19 per acre? We, we've calculated at $83 million an acre, Madam Speaker. $83 million an acre. And uh, Madam Speaker, to you to staff, what is the cost for building a community center, something like Agencourt Community Center? Through you, Madam Speaker, anywhere between 35 and $40 million. Thank you. So for $80 million per acre times 20 acres, we can build, if I'm not mistaken, my math doesn't, um, we can build 40 community centers. Would that be correct? Through you, Madam Speaker, if using that math, that would be correct. So thank you. Um, but I, I should uh, just to... to uh, to clarify, the, the, some of the funding and the way that it's allocated uh, would not be allocated in that way through the allocation policy that we currently have. The $1.6 billion through you, Madam Speaker, to staff, how would this money be um, brought in? How are we going to find this money besides taxing our, our residents? So, so, Madam Speaker, very good question. Um, we have some existing dollars that have been collected for this purpose. Uh, uh, we haven't allocated a, a significant amount of money there. We own um, 1.5 of the 6.3 hectare site. Uh, we have future DCs. We have future Section 42 parkland dedication, uh, cash and lieu monies, Section 37s, and there's discussion in the re report about an area rate or other mechanisms that we might use in the area. And finally, we think it would be an excellent candidate for provincial and federal support uh, in, in, on a go-forward basis. But we don't have this provincial or federal support right at this very moment. Would I be correct? Uh, no, Madam Speaker, we do not. Okay. So how much money are we at this moment, taking into account that, would we have to raise in order to be able to say, we got that park we can build? Again, Madam Speaker, the $1.665 million figure is the number. And we've That's got, what very, we need we've right got now? various sources from both existing sources and future sources. We have 140 to 180,000 units, 140 to 180,000 units coming into this area of the downtown in the next 25 years. But through, through, I only have 15 seconds, how much money will we need right now in order for us to say we acquire that park? The total cost is 1.665. We do have some That's existing what we need. dollars. That's what we need right now. Councillor Holliday. Thank you, Speaker. To continue on uh, my colleague's questions there, would I, without going into the number or even any specifics, w is it fair to say that the acquisition of the air rights, which is essentially the acquisition of the land, is a very small component of the 1665? Madam Speaker, the um, air rights are not a fee simple. They're not dirt. They're not down to the center of the earth and up to the middle. They're just the air rights. They're just a strata. And yes, it's a relatively small amount. So would it be fair to say that essentially for 1665, we are manufacturing or inventing a park? We're, we're, we're creating a park from nothing. Like it, it, it is, it's not going to be on typical land. It's on a strata. We're creating a surface out of nowhere. So we're manufacturing a park. Have we ever done anything like that before? Uh, yes, uh, Madam Speaker. As in Ward 11, we have a sm similar park on smaller scale in Weston. Okay. Yep. 
Um, so the other thing I, I re recall that we were talking about at Council uh, and is ongoing and will be ongoing for a number of years is the manufacture of the sections of the gardener. And I think there's still some decisions to be made about the technology, but if I recall, there's, there's columns, there's bents, and then we're, we're going to look at making decking and either casting it in place or perhaps manufacturing the pieces and bringing it to the gardener. Is there any opportunity, because it looks awfully similar, just wider, of extending those processes or extending those plants that we might be creating to create the gardener to maybe appropriate them now for the creation of the deck structure for rail deck? Uh, Madam Speaker, that's possible. We're using, we've used in the, in the precast pre concrete uh, regime of 1955 to 50, 61 <coughs> on the gardener, new technology precast right. concrete, and we may indeed be able to do that similarly on the rail deck. Um, one thing I note, though, is that rail deck has a northern edge and a southern edge, and the northern edge predominantly appears to be ours, and the southern edge looks like to be a collection of condominiums. Um, do you have some sense of security or, or uh, optimism about the ability to reinforce the south wall of this rail deck? Because from the picture, it looks like you're going to have a roll of columns down the center, and you've got to bear the weight on the center and then on the other two edges. Are we able to achieve that along the, uh, along the uh, condominium side? So, Madam Speaker, we own both the 14-foot strip on the northern side around Front Street, and we own Rail Deck Park, although it's just a strata. There's some condominiums underneath it, yes. So you're, you're confident that we, we can build this without giving up too much space on the south side to, to bear the weight of that deck structure? Yes, the columns would actually be inside the rail corridor adjacent to the wall. They would be the principal supports and then, de and then other columns throughout the uh, rail I guess the last question, um, it's, I'm intrigued by the structure of this and how we're going to phase it. It looks like we have to do a lot of work below the surface of the plane of the surface. We've got to build these columns and build foundations and foundation walls. Is the plan to do that in small pieces or are we going to try to get all that civil work done down in the rail corridor because it's very disruptive to the operations? and then add these deck pieces over time. I know there's two phases contemplated, or three phases contemplated in the report. Right. What's the vision here? We have to do a big cash investment up front to do this groundwork, and then the decks will slide in over time, uh, and we'll see the park take shape. So, Madam, Madam Speaker, the, the principal place that we think it could start is the Spadina Front RER station, that area, and we, and we logically could then extend it to the south side. So that's what we said is phase one, likely. And you'd have all that column placement. We've got a serious set of allowances for that work to be done, but we should be getting those column placements in as quickly as possible. They would be advantageous to us in the future. Maybe a better way to characterize the question, are we front-end loading a lot of the civil work, or are we going to see yes. returns on this investment in increments right away so we don't have to do a whole bunch of invisible civil work to finally get the surfaces that we want, or are we going to see them coming into place over time? Uh, they, we can do both, but it would be, I think, it'd be advantageous to get as much of that civil work pre in place. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cressy to speak. Councillor Cressy. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, and, and I will begin, first of all, by thanking our City of Toronto staff across departments who have spent from parks to city planning to real estate to build Toronto and others an exceptional amount of time and due diligence on this project, and I want to thank them. Uh, our Parks and Environment Chair, uh, Councillor McMahon, has been a staunch <laughs> attendee of meetings in Ward 20 in recent months on this project, uh, and of course Mayor Tory for both his leadership and his vision on a citywide project here. I want to acknowledge his leadership. Uh, I just want to say a few words, take a few minutes on this project, as it is a big project. I'll begin by just saying, why is this important? It's important because I think the obligation for all of us as city builders should be to build a city for 50 years from now, rather than thinking about building a city for today. And you've heard under questioning the rationale from the local context in the local neighborhood. The population of downtown has doubled in the last 15 years and it will double again to a half a million people in the next 25 years. In the meantime, we have not built parkland to keep up. We just haven't. 
And so if you want to build a livable neighborhood, you have to invest in the parks and the community amenities to make it actually livable. I thought Councillor DiCiano had an excellent line of questioning, which was, given all the development that has taken place in downtown, why haven't we done this up until now? And Councillor DiCiano was right. We should have done it already. So let's do it now. But this is not just about livability and dealing with growing population and a working population in downtown. This is about a city-wide destination. It is about a city-wide objective. And that is, we build these central projects not just for regions. The CN Tower was not built and it is not called the Downtown Tower. The, the Toronto Zoo was not built for or called the Scarborough Zoo. They're Toronto destinations. And so too is Rail Deck Park. Adjacent to the Rogers Centre and the CN Tower and the Aquarium to have a new 21 acre central park there will be a destination, yes, for residents of this city, but tourists and visitors as well. And this isn't a radical concept. It's not a pie-in-the-sky idea. New York City, when they built the High Line, it quickly became the second most popular tourist destination in all of New York. In Chicago, when they built Millennium Park, and people scoffed, everybody said to the mayor at the time, don't do it. Don't do it. It's going to cost too much. Well, the mayor at the time put his head down, got it done, and guess what? Millennium Park is now the sixth most popular tourist destination in the entire United States, with 15 million annual visitors. And so, when you invest in the future, you get a better future. That's what this is. And so, the question I get asked a lot is actually, can you actually pay for it? Is funding going to happen? And so to that, the principle here, which is an important one, starts from the premise of growth pays for growth. And in doing so, it's worth getting into the details because it actually lifts up the entire city. Section 42, our park acquisition funds, we are under collecting. Because of the cap on 10% of the land value, when we build a condo in downtown at 270 units or 570 units, we get about the same amount of money. And so when we under collect in park acquisition, we all across the city fail. And here's how. John Libby has explained that when we bring forward TO core and a parkland strategy with it, we will also be proposing to increase the rates of Section 42. Is that good for downtown? It is. Because 50% of Section 42 stays in the ward, 25% to the district, and 25% to the city as a whole. Which means that when you increase the Section 42 rates in downtown Toronto to pay for this project, you increase the amount of money to pay for park projects right across the city. It is a rising tide that lifts all boats when you do it right. And so, is city building about the future? It should be. You have to imagine that future before you build it. And 50 years from now, when we're sitting in Rail Deck Park, I don't think anybody's going to sit out there and say, gee, I wish we built nine more towers. If you go to R Central Park in New York City today, I don't think anybody's sitting in there saying, gee, I wish we built 20 towers here. I know it's a big project, but city building costs money. Thank, and it's time you. we step up. Thank you, Councillor Cressy. Councillor Mamaliti. Madam Chair, I'm going to move that City Council direct that no funds be spent on Rail Deck Park until city staff have done a review of all city parks and identified and eliminated any deficiencies. Uh, and, I, and the reason I move that is obvious. There's a lot of deficiencies in every one of our wards. We have been told for years that we don't have enough money to build uh, a playground, let alone uh, even in some cases replace swing sets. Uh, and, and now we're, we're looking at spending $3 billion. And let me just say this to you. Some, some of you might be happy uh, when I say this. If this thing um, comes under $3 billion in costs by the time it's finished being built, I will resign. And I, and, and I, and I mean it. Because I'm sure, I am sure that this thing's going to cost at least $3 billion at the end of the day. And for me to justify and go to my community and tell them that we uh, need to wait 
for that swing set. And we need to wait for that, for that new uh, parquet. And, and yeah, we've only got about $100,000 that we could spend this year in our parks budget. Uh, but yet, we, we can find $3 billion to spend in a park downtown uh, to walk our poodles in. Uh, you know what they'll tell me? They'll tell me that we're wrong. They'll tell me that the direction of, of City Hall is wrong. And they'll tell me that we are incredibly irresponsible. That's what they'll tell me. And so I stand here saying to you, $3 billion? Are we serious? And some of you are actually going to vote for this? Knowing that there's also people with air rights on this site, and we've got, to, we've got a legal matter at hand, and we have to deal with the, the equation of, of courts and, get, and deal with the equation of the rights of other people. And we are sitting here saying how wonderful this is going to be, how wonderful this poodle park is going to be. For the citizens, this $3 billion poodle park is going to be for the city of Toronto. I cannot believe that we are doing this. The gardener, how many times have we stood up here trying to find the money to be able to deal with the deterioration of the gardener? How many times have we, as cons with our constituents, as councillors, had meetings to deal with the roads that we have that aren't being repaired? Because we can't find the capital money. How many times have your constituents said that our parks need addressing? That we can't cut the grass? That we can't deal with our, our, bar, our ballparks because it's dangerous for our children? And the, the, the excuse that we're given is there's no money. We don't have the money to be able to do it. So, but now we do. We've got $3 billion to build a brand new poodle park for the city of Toronto. I'm glad people are going to have a place where their dogs can go and do whatever they need to do. But in my particular community, not only don't we have enough parks, but the ones we do have are not being tended to. So for me to stand up and support this has got to be the stupidest thing that I could be doing as a politician. And I hope that people are taking note of this, because I have a feeling that this is going to be much larger in, 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 in the next election than you can ever imagine. I don't believe this is going to be, be something that's going to get built. I think it's going to be squashed. And the unfortunate part of this is that we're given direction to actually start spending some of this money. So, give me the option. My community doesn't want to pay for this. And every time there is a development, we don't get, we don't get anywhere near the amount of money in, in transfer payments from any of the developments. Be it Section 37, 45, uh, give it whatever name you want it, we don't get it. And the cash and loo money, we have got to split with, yes, the downtown part of the city, because now we're asking for all of that money to be dipped into Councillor Cressy is ward, and I think there are two other councils around there. I can't live with this. I hope that you can't live with this. And I hope you can ask the questions about where we're going to find the, the billions of dollars it's going to Thank cost. Thank you, Councillor Mamley. Your time's up. Councillor Kerrigan. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, Madam Speaker, I, I have a different idea of what's irresponsible. In, in my view, what's irresponsible is to mischaracterize and misrepresent what's happening today. Uh, to, to, be, to be disingenuous with our community. If we're talking about going back to our community, if you were to go back to your community and say that what we're doing today goes beyond anything that it says in the report, and let's remember, what it says in the report is that this decision you're taking today has zero financial impact. Not $3 billion, not even $1.1 billion. The decision you're taking today has zero financial impact. Unless you're, once again, as happens so often in this chamber, disparaging the work of staff, then 
What's irresponsible would be to go out and lie to your community about the decisions we take. I'd be voting against it myself if they were saying, let's amass the money right now, let's put it in the capital project for, for the very next five years, and let's vote on it this year. I'd be voting against it too. But that is not what is before you. And to go out into your communities and score political points by calling this a poodle park, worth more than the report says that it would be worth based on an estimate that is at only 5% of the design, and that we're proceeding with it holus bolus, that's what's irresponsible. And, and it's odd because when we're talking about uh, a transit project, um, uh, something that is part of the vision of the city, uh, we're fine with irresponsibility and misinformation and, and escalating costs. But when we're talking about quality of life in a part of the town that our ward isn't in, suddenly visioning well in advance of ever spending that dime one is a problem for you. Now, you're looking at two items. We're about to vote on the zoning of this and, and the adoption and, and the acceptance that the feasibility study says that we should continue to study whether or not we can, in fact, put this park in place. And it says that we should zone today to make it clear to the development community that this is what we want on top of our rail lands in this particular place. This is what we want to look at being here. And that is, as Mr. Lintern has already outlined, what you do well in advance, 10 years, 20 years, in advance of ever having to write a check. This is the type of groundwork you do if your vision is to one day have something in the magnitude of a Millennium Park. If you have the kind of bold vision for this city, and you should have it for the core city, no matter where you're, uh, you're uh, uh, representing. If you have no vision for the core city, then I dare say the money you hope to flow to your community isn't ever going to get there. Because let's be clear, the generator of the economy of this nation is happening in the financial core of our city. And whether we like it or not, we have joined other world-class cities in making sure that in that very financial service sector core, in whatever is the financial driver of your core city, we've chosen to mix residents with that exciting business core. We're not alone in that. All the best cities in the world do that. And so they have to inject into that core, that central business district, a quality of life quotient. And you have to start well in advance if you're going to achieve it. That's all that's happening here. And so the buzz that you want to create around your city that is happening in places like Melbourne, that, that happened, people have forgotten how very much one foot on a banana hill New York City was at one time. People have forgotten because of the vision that led to such things as, as, as the High Line, whatever the model you use to get it there. And so that's all that's happening today, something that will lead one day to the park. But if you're planning on going back and spending election year saying that you need me or someone's going to spend $3 billion next year, that's what's irresponsible, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Kerjianis. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Madam Speaker, I, I've asked staff a couple of questions and I got my answers. And one of the answers, um, and I had miscalculated, I had calculated $76 uh, million for an acre. They told me it was over 80. We also heard from staff that um, with $80 million, you can certainly build uh, two um, community centers. So Madam Speaker, we're looking at roughly uh, 20 acres times 80 million, comes out 1.6. This is money that we're gonna to have to raise through our tax base. This is money that in 40 wards we can put two community centers. Community centers that are at the top of the line. Community centers that can have a swimming pool. Community centers that can have uh, uh, meeting rooms. Community centers that can, can, it can be there to, to, to look after our seniors and, the, and, and, and to look after the whole community. In my ward, I only have one community center. And that community center is not as the community center that $40 million would buy. In my ward, I have a community center, St. Paul's, I mean, Lamaru, that's 
for 25 years, it hadn't gotten the paint, it was not painted. And all of a sudden they painted it and, and we had a reopening. So for me to support something that says $1.66 billion, and a, a few months ago it was 1.1 and now it's 1.6, and I will not disagree with Councilor Mamalita that this can go up even higher, closer to two and a half to three, three billion dollars to support something like this, I'm finding it kind of hard. I'd rather take the $1.66 billion and use it towards um, um, start tunneling across Shepherd Subway in order to look after the residents um, of Scarborough, north of the 401, that certainly have been forgotten and treated as second-class citizens. So this goes back to the point of pitting downtown against the suburbs. And if we were to spend this kind of money, I'm wondering how much money are we going to spend in the suburbs. Uh, this is um, uh, looking after two wards that indeed could be uh, part of the, um, the hub of the, of, uh, the city of Toronto, uh, part of the economic engine that runs Canada, but certainly it's not only those two wards, but it's the whole city of Toronto. And if you're going to say that the city of Toronto is an economic engine that drives Canada, then all the parts of the city of Toronto should be treated equally. I have not heard $1.66 billion uh, being used to uh, my ward and, and, and uh, Councillor Kelly's wards or uh, Councillor uh, uh, Chin Lee's uh, ward or Councillor uh, Matlow's or anybody else's. So the question does rise, why are we going to spend the $1.66 billion downtown? When the air rights are certainly not ours, uh, there's a contravention, there's, there's all kinds of uh, situations happening down there. We are told that uh, a builder, uh, Senator Holmes and Kraft Homes, have acquired the air rights. We're told they're not. Uh, they've approached the city. They were not given a clear answer. Um, we're not meeting with them. We're not telling them anything. And all of a sudden, we're, we're going straight down this road. We're going to spend $1.66 billion. A couple of months ago, it was $1.1. So we added half a billion within half a year. So if we're going to think about this exponentially, every half a year, we're going to be adding an extra half a billion dollars. By the time we're finished, that bill could be $3 billion, could be $5 billion, it even could be higher. So therefore, Madam Speaker, I'm finding it very hard to support something like this. When my residents, it takes them one, point, one hour and 15 minutes to come downtown. When staff are coming to me and saying, Councillor, uh, we cannot build, um, we're going to build you a go station, but we're not going to get you parking beside it. Uh, I do not have... Um, other means of people to come downtown except TTC and now the gold train and TTC takes you one and a half hours, one, 1. 1.15 to one and a half. So why are we treating my constituents, Councillor Kelly's, uh, Councillor uh, Kelly's constituents, Councillor Chin Lee's constituents, any different from what we treat? <laughs> well, Councillor, would you like it or not, they're still your constituents. Um, they're north of the 401, and unless your people live in another place that mine do, we share the constituency base. And that constituency base is saying, why are we spending $1.66 billion downtown? Are we children of our lesser God? And Madam Speaker, since I've come to this place, they've been treated as such. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Oh, I like that. I like that. Well, I Thank you, Councillor Karagiannis. <laughs> Councillor Carroll, are you a, or Councillor uh, Kelly, are you a child of a lesser god? <laughs> oh. oh, Speaker, oh. Speaker, I have to. I, I want to start off by saying, I love the idea of the uh, of the uh, of Rail Park. I really do. Um, members of council have a uh, have have to choose between two basic options: you're either an accountant or a visionary, and I think. To build a great city, you have to have a vision. Uh, and uh, you know, just as I'm willing to uh, spend billions of dollars in Scarborough for the vision of uh, subways uh, there and everywhere else across the city, I'm delighted to support spending billions of dollars for the Rail Deck Park. The, you know, remember the debate over Sugar Beach? Remember that? Well, that was people dead. thought it was people thought it was a waste of money. One what they didn't get was that in today's world and tomorrow's as well, 
with that intense competition between urban regions to attract the best people and lots of money, you've got to project a cool brand. And that's what Sugar Beach did. And the number of photographs that were taken of that beach that were shown worldwide was fabulous. And when you close your eyes and just feel what that park downtown would mean to this city in attracting people and keeping people, I think that it's money, frankly, on the long run, that's worth investing. Now, there's nothing in this that says for sure that's going to happen. Lots of, lots of obstacles to, become over, uh, to be overcome in the years that lie ahead. But I'd rather have that, Speaker, as a guiding principle than to have none at all. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Uh, Madam Speaker is next. Hang on a sec. There you are. Thank you. Just briefly, um, you know, each member of council have projects in their ward that they need. Um, years ago, uh, in City of York, I didn't have a community centre, so I fought for it. This council voted for the budget, and we built a community centre because we needed one in my community. And I'm sure Councillor Mamalides will come forward shortly and wanting money for a project in his ward. And I don't know if we're going to vote for it, Councillor Mamaliti. <laughs> but um, I'm sure you're going to come forward with your, he's up there. He's up there. But I just want to, um, just to mention FYI, and the, and the Deputy City Manager did mention it. I have a rail deck park in my ward in Weston. It's not 21 acres, it's a small rail deck park, but it's in Weston and uh, it was paid for by Metrolinx. It was a partnership with the school board and we are going to, we have, we're um, going to build a playground, a, an off-leash dog park <clears throat> and a community garden. And uh, you know, and my community is so excited about it and has been built, Metrolinx did build it. And uh, so, you know, it, it can happen. And, um, you know, it's at, at a smaller scale, of course, but uh, so I was the first for Rail Deck Park. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Councillor Matlow. Um, Madam, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, so I want to stand in support of uh, moving forward with exploring how we can build Rail Deck Park. And I want to acknowledge uh, the leadership of both uh, Mayor Tory uh, and the local councillor, uh, uh, Councillor Cressy, uh, for making sure that as obstacles are in our way, that they work together on trying to resolve them, trying to figure out a way through them. Uh, as, as was said, I think, by Councillor uh, Kelly, this is not simple. Uh, this is not a slam dunk, and uh, we, we don't have the funds, and we don't have uh, even the full rights to the property. That being said, though, uh, the vision is based on evidence. We know that there is already enormous intensification in the core, and we know, based on staff uh, reports, that there is an enormous deficiency in access to parkland in that area. We also know for a fact that there is projected further intensification uh, beyond imagination in that area. So the people who live there currently need more access to park space, but also the future Torontonians who are going to be living in that community or those who might live, from, live currently in other areas who might move to that area need access to parkland too. So I wanted to just express my support for what I think is visionary and something that all of Toronto can be proud of. But speaking of all of Toronto, um, we heard a lecture earlier from Councillor Mamaliti about uh, we shouldn't be doing uh, this, even though we're not spending a penny today, uh, because uh, there are parks that need attention in the city. But it's not an either or question. Yes, we need to improve our parks throughout the city. All of us should be dedicated to that goal, no matter what corner of the city that is. And yes, it is also an equally a fact that this area of the city is parkland deficient and that we need to improve their quality of life. Both are true, both facts coexist. Moreover, 
um, this, uh, for example, this member, um, you know, admittedly, I will, I will challenge the mayor when I believe that there's something that he has done that I should challenge him on, as I did moments ago. But the cartoons that he does are absurd and, and insensitive and disrespectful, and that's the kind of tone that we heard using language like Poodle Park. It's one thing if you agree or disagree with Rail Deck Park, but I call it Poodle Park. I don't know if it looks bad on the poodles or him, but it's bad. This is also a member who talked about wasting money. Well, uh, let me just read you something. This is, I'm not, I'm not alleging anything, I'm just reading something here from cbc.ca that Councillor Mamaliti, uh, on a four-day trip to Ottawa, chose to stay at the Chateau Laurier. Why? Point to personal privilege. Uh, Councillor Campbell, then Councillor Kerjanis. My colleague is not here to defend himself, and I, and I, and I, well, he's not, he's not right here in the chamber to defend himself, and I, and I, I'd like you to rule his comments out of order, and maybe ask him to withdraw them, because I'm he's, he's not speaking to them, he's not speaking to the issue at hand, which is the rail deck park. Okay. It'd be, it, it would just, I think we're all concerned, we prefer to be just stuck to the issue at hand. There is a member, uh, Madam Speaker, there's a member with a motion in front of us that we do hold not on, on, uh, move forward with, uh, with uh, Rail Deck Park. Yeah. Yeah, but just a sec. Councillor Karagiannis, uh, you had a point of order. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I, 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 I'm looking for your guidance. I think the, the, the thing in question is the railway park, the rail deck park, and we're speaking to that. We're not speaking about what somebody spent uh, outside the... Uh, Outside of the city business, we're not speaking about something else that says, if, if the member has comments specifically to that, I would say to you that he has to stick to that and not take on other colleagues what they've done and what they haven't done or what they've said or what they haven't said. That is absolutely inappropriate in this, in this chamber. And Madam Speaker, I'm looking to your leadership to put a stop to it once and for all. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Okay, so Councillor Matlow. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So, um, uh, and, and I'll explain like why, to, why I'm in this line of No, uh, no, but Councillor Matlow, would you like to withdraw your comment? Oh, no, but, not at all. No. No. Okay. Um, point. Point of privilege, Councillor Mamaliti. Well, I, uh, well, I'm entertained by, uh, by Councillor Matlow and his version of what is uh, responsible or not. Uh, there's a clear difference between an FCM conference in which a hotel costs uh, a significant amount of money, that's the hotels they choose, uh, to $3 billion for a, a poodle park. And so if you, wanna, if you want, Councillor Matlow, through the chair, to compare uh, a conference that I was at uh, and the cost of a, a hotel that uh, the FCM chooses as one of their venues over a $3 billion poodle park, go for it. Go for it. Okay. Uh, Councillor Mamaliti, the problem is that what triggered this debate is that you um, mentioned the Rail Deck Park as a poodle park, um, which is very offensive. No. Offensive. So, <laughs> Councillor Matlow, as far as uh, your comments about the conference and that, I will ask you to wit I will ask you to withdraw that uh, those comments, please. Um, I, I'd be happy to withdraw those comments that I just read off cbc.ca. Um, That's okay. But ultimately, ultimately... Um, Councillor Kerjanis, uh, Councillor Matlow apologized. Madam, Madam Speaker, the apology is that I read from. Those comments were totally inappropriate in his speech. That's the leadership that we're looking at you to address. And I'm saying that uh, he... He apologized, and that's acceptable. Thank you, Councillor Matlow. And, you know, and, and indeed, the point that I was making is that um, sort of the divisive rhetoric, um, you know, whether it be ar around transit, whether it be about Rail Deck Park, whether it be, um, you know, our area, city, our area of the city versus another area of the city, doesn't help us move forward. Just because uh, Council may support moving forward with, and again, I'd like to support a seven-stop LRT um, in, in Scarborough. The mayor would like uh, a one-stop subway, but I believe we both uh, care about Scarborough. 
just because uh, Councillor Cressy and the mayor and others would like to see a rail deck park uh, uh, be, be manifested, doesn't mean that they don't care about a park in Councillor Mamalidi's ward. So to, to, to suggest otherwise, not only is unhelpful, it's wrong. It doesn't help us, and it doesn't help the people in Councillor Cressy's ward who may one day decide to live in Councillor Mamalidi's ward or Councillor DiCiano's ward or anywhere else, and vice versa. In other words, we're all Torontonians. We all rely on the same transit system. We all enjoy and use our parks, and we all recognize <coughs> that we need to use evidence and facts to support where we make investments. Today what we're doing is we're trying to determine whether or not it is feasible to move forward with what is fairly described as a visionary plan. And once again, I want to acknowledge both Mayor Tory and the local councillor, Councillor Cressy, along with all of you who are supporting this exploration to improve our city for every single Torontonian and hopefully for everyone who visits our city too. Thank, Thank you. you. Councillor McMahon. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So I'm just over here because I'm going to use the overhead in a minute. But um, I will just say from my experience working with our um, dynamic park staff, I've never had a problem getting things done in my parks. In fact, in the seven short years I've been here, that we've had, I've worked well with them. They've worked great together with uh, me to improve make an improvement in every single one of my parks in my ward because that was uh, something we did together. So I'm not sure why it takes another councillor who's been in for 17 years and unable to get the grass cut or a swing set or other improvements. So um, I'm really surprised at that. But I just want to talk about why, um, why we need uh, Rail Deck Park. And uh, I'll show you some pictures first off that uh, Councillor Prutza, Councillor Prutza, if you could pay attention, this is good for you. Um, we, other cities are doing it, other world-class cities. So you have uh, um, Mel or sorry, Melbourne and Chicago, we know Millennium Park, Boston, Texas, or sorry, Dallas, Texas, and Munich, and Toronto next. So it's not some off-the-wall idea, random idea. It has been done successfully in other cities and will be done in Toronto. Um, you know, we're always talking about the, the suburbs coming up short with every single thing. Um, well, the suburbs do not come up short with, uh, with nature, with green. Um, so we want to talk about equity, and this is why we should do Rail Deck Park, equity of green space, and, and how downtowners are actually deprived of parkland. And there's your, there's your comparison. In fact, Scarborough is, is much higher than the, uh, the average um, of amount of green space per, per resident. And so I just want you to take a look at that and realize it's not, a, again, it's not a divisive suburbs against the downtown uh, argument. It is, it is green space benefits everyone, as we know, mentally, physically, and um, spiritually. Um, access to nature improves, uh, improves your quality of life and, and your happiness. So it's not anything uh, untoward against the suburbs. And as far as the money, the third issue as to why, it's not, we're looking at other, all kinds of creative outside the box thinking for financing. We're looking at conservancy model as has been done successfully in other cities and this is being done right now in Toronto with the Bentway. And we're looking at philanthropy, and uh, as you know, we're reviewing our Section 42 uh, financing. And um, my last point um, is interesting that actually an elevated um, park was proposed uh, during a mayoral campaign a while ago um, by a Ward 7 uh, councillor candidate at the time, Mr. Giorgio Mammoliti, did propose an elevated park and so I'm not sure if we've just um, had a mental block into that but he was quite supportive of the rail deck then of an elevated park and I'm not sure why he wouldn't be now okay thank you <laughs> councillor councillor Hart thank you speaker 
Uh, one of the earlier speakers on this item mentioned that all parts of the city should be treated equally. And I agree 100 percent. You know, as the councillor who probably represents maybe the greenest ward in this city, I stand up and support 100 percent Rail Deck Park. You know, my son moved downtown this summer to 1 King Street West, and he said to me two things, Dad. He says, I love it downtown. It's so vibrant. There's so much to do. Transit's fantastic. Everything's at my doorstep. But I miss two things. And I said, what's that? He said, I miss the sun, and I miss all things green. And that's why I support this. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Mamaliti, your point of privilege. I, I can't tell you how much I love people standing up and using the name. As long as you say it right, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, but at the, en at the end of the day, you talk about what I did uh, through you, Madam Speaker, when I ran for mayor. Yes, uh, but it was a private uh, venture Councilor that I Mamaliti, was proposing. Councillor Mamaliti, that's not a point of privilege. I'm sorry. Councillor Mamaliti. You should read the procedure bylaw on what a point of privilege is. Councillor Lee to speak. Road tolls. Councillor Lee. It's right here. Road tolls. Count. Oh, please. Thank you very much, Councillor Lee. And uh, I rise to support the recommendation to, uh, on the Vale Deck Park. I recently had a town hall in my area, and one resident came up and asked me, he says, are we going to be paying for Vale Deck Park? Or are the developers going to be doing that? And sure enough, point three here, we are developing a strategy, growth base, focus. So new developments in the area, you know, after we develop this strategy, will be paying towards financing this park. And every resident in Toronto deserves to have good space. And uh, when uh, a councillor stands up and uh, categorize it as that you're going to lose all your money to be, towards the, to be put towards the uh, Real Deck Park, it is disingenuous. And attention getting. Attention getting, okay? Yes. And he was right. He's trying to get attention. We're giving it to him, unfortunately. Okay? And I think my colleague here keeps mentioning my name that I need things in my area. Yes, we all need things in our area. But. He has Lemuru Park, which is a nice park in the area with a kids' town in it. Okay? Beautiful kids' town and a Lemuru Community Center. I have a district park in my area called Millican Park. All of us do. Most of us in the suburb do. It's not a suburb downtown divide. We are all residents of this big city of ours and we should be helping each other. Make it livable, make it workable, and make it great for the rest of our citizens. So I fully support this because this is based on providing the necessary living conditions in the area. So I fully support this. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Palacio. Thank you, Speaker. I'm rising to speak in favor of uh, the recommendations before us. I do support the creation of green space and recreational spaces in any areas of the city that are parkland deficient. This part of town, in the downtown, is parkland deficient tremendously. As the area is gentrifying, as other parts of the city as well, there is a need for more green space, recreational space. The Union Station Rail Corridor presents uh, an opportunity of a lifetime. And, and I think this is uh, what it means building the, the Rail Deck Park. It's a city building project that it will add so much value to the city of Toronto, to all of us, irrespectively where we live in the city of Toronto. This is a city building project. The same thing can be said in other parts of the city that we are parkland deficient. For example, in my own community, Madam Speaker and members of the council. World 17 Davenport is very parkland deficient. And I've been asking our city staff for years to help us to acquire some land, either through the hydro land corridor, 
is um, that we have plenty of space that can be acquired at very little cost, just through lease agreements. By doing so, we are bringing some life and vitality to these communities that need so much. And what's the cost? Just the operational cost. As simple as that. Now, there is no question that with this uh, proposed park that we're talking in downtown, that's going to bring tremendous benefits, not only to the local residents there, but as I mentioned before, to tourists and the city in general. And this is an opportunity of a lifetime. As city, as city staff has uh, noted, this once in a generation opportunity that we shouldn't miss. I know that this park, as other lands that have the potential of um, creating what we really need and people treasure, will increase the quality of life, health, and sustainability of uh, all throughout Toronto, in this case, in the downtown of our beautiful city. That's one of the reasons that I do support wholeheartedly what's before us. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Thompson to speak. Uh, thank you, Speaker, Madam Speaker. Uh, speaker, I rise in support of the item in front of us uh, to advance the uh, uh, Stage 2 um, uh, work plan for Rail Deck Park. And as a member of council who represents an area that's outside of the downtown core, I just wanted to draw your attention to the fact that I've had discussions with my residents about Rail Deck Park. And in fact, that the conversation was, why do we need it? Why do we want to spend money on it? It's no good to me. It, I'm not going to benefit from, from it. And I've had to help them to understand, quite frankly, the reasons why we need it um, and the fact that they will, in fact, benefit from it. They talk about the money, they talk about the fact that we're wasting a lot of money on, on a venture like this. Um, uh, you know, and recommendation number three talks about how we're looking at raising funds to support, uh, obviously, the development of, uh, of Rail Deck Park. Whether or not at the end of the day it will be named Rail Deck Park, I don't know. But the fact of the matter is that we have seen, Council Mary Margaret McMahon has actually put on the screen what other cities around the world are doing. If this city and if members of council are in fact inclined to develop and doing what's best for the city, <coughs> this is one of those initiatives that we have to stand behind because it has huge ramification of benefits. Yes, it does have an issue with respect to costs. And the question is always, we don't have the money, where does the money come from? We bought, we've, we've, we've made plans to, to buy light rail vehicles when we had no funds, but we've actually got the vehicles, some that are on the street, some that we're waiting for. We've made a lot of plans with respect to not having the resources readily available. Fact of the matter is that if everything that we did here was done based on the absolute certainty and assurance that we had all of the monies in the bank and we can just put the shovel on the ground, quite frankly, that would be an amazing opportunity. But we know that we deal with scarce resources and so on. We have a tangible, solid plan in order to go forward with. Staff's working on it. The mayor's leadership has been invaluable to this whole particular process. And as someone who represents an area that's outside of the downtown, I can assure you that my residents will benefit. We have not even began to explore the full economic impact that will be created by having this innovative a park, utilizing technology and design and so on. There'll be immense benefit that will come to the residents of Toronto. I submit to you, Speaker, that our job isn't to be parochial. Our job is to build the city, to bring things together and look at its best interest. What do we do for that next generation? We have an area that is really a bit of a blight on Toronto, that we have an opportunity really to, uh, to engage it, to basically bring a sense of renaissance and renewal in this area. We have a plan to do that. We ought not to simply talk about the fact that, well, I don't have a rail deck park, so Councillor Cressy can't have a rail deck park, and I don't have a this and I don't have a that, so you can't have it either. That is not the reasons why we're here. The reasons why we're here are to make good, effective decisions in the best interests of this city. There's economic benefit, there's social benefits. I can tell you, Speaker, when I lived at Harbourfront many years ago, 
Oh, I used to walk around with my young son and push him in his stroller. People from across the city would go to Harborfront because really that was their vacation spot. That was their cottage in the city. The contribution that the city continues to make to Harborfront is a benefit to all residents, not just the residents, from the immediate waterfront area. I use that as a minor example with respect to Rail Deck Park. Having traveled and having done a lot of work in economic development for this city on behalf of an economic development, you see around the world what other cities are doing. If we are a world-class city and if we aspire to be such, we ought to be innovative, we ought to be progressive. This is a progressive, innovative aspect of our advancement and our development. And I think that we ought to recognize why we are here. We're here to do the best for all the residents in Toronto, not to be parochial. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Councillor Shan. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I represent the northeast corner of this city, um, the furthest away, I would say, from here, uh, most likely the furthest away uh, from the Royal Deck Park. But I'm strongly in support of it for many reasons. One of the reasons is that I think many of us are, uh, are not noticing a trend where a lot of the suburban population, some of the young ones are moving outward into the 905, but many of the young ones are moving inward into the downtown uh, to start their life and to kind of uh, come to a more urban, more uh, condo living kind of atmosphere. And, and a lot of these uh, young people who are starting off their careers are having children, and many of these children, not poodles, are in search of, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, public space for, for playing. So it's very important for us to keep that in mind and to be able to be respectful that a family-friendly downtown is a, is a must for us uh, as we move forward. And so I'm in strong support of this. And I think if you want to build a, a strong generation of, uh, of citizens, residents in, in the city of Toronto, we have to be able to provide a wholesome experience for our children. The second thing I, 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 I want to kind of caution, though, is that I know Councillor Cressy mentioned uh, CN Tower and Toronto Zoo as examples. Uh, those aren't perfectly the most affordable or accessible places. So I would like to see this even one step further because I know that in my area there is Toronto Zoo, but a lot of my residents haven't even stepped into Toronto Zoo. I know there are a lot of Torontonians who haven't been to anywhere on top of the uh, CN Tower. So I think this has to be an equalizer. If you vision this, if you're trying to vision a park in the downtown, it has to be an equalizer. It has to be a place that is affordable. It has to be a place that's accessible in all forms of a way and, and, and to be um, as much as possible in public hands. So I know there were a lot of conversations around downtown versus Scarborough, the suburbs versus downtown. Um, unfortunately, it's a reality that some of us have to face. And it is important to acknowledge that while I support this park, while I support the bike lanes, while I support many things that are happening in downtown, I seek to uh, get input from my downtown fellow councillors, not to lecture them as to what their solution should be. I could be standing here and say, why not have 100 small parks more close to your apartments than to have one big park? And these are the kind of discussions that I could be prescribing. But it's very, very important to understand from the local realities. And sometimes Scarborough councillors who have stood up here to support initiatives like bike lanes, support initiatives like like Rail Deck Park, feel like our version of our cries, of our realities, are not attended to as much. But that is the frustration some of us have. But that doesn't take away from the fact we stand here and support a visionary project like this, because vision is what is important. So I hope when we talk about transit planning, when we talk about housing planning, there is a vision that is attested to it, not just kind of talking about this is too much money, this is too much money. Because sometimes we see some of the most progressive voices complaining about a lot of money being spent on things that we need to be spent on. So I would caution with that and say, you know, this is my pledge of support to Rail Deck Park. This is a visionary thing in our city. This is going to be a great equalizer for people who need to grow their families in downtown in a wholesome, uh, environmentally friendly atmosphere. And I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing this flourish in the coming years. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor DiCiano. Yeah, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I, I'll just begin quickly by echoing, um, I guess, most councillors in here, but, uh, you know, steal a page from Councillor Kelly's book. Um, you know, definitely our city uh, would benefit from a project like this. It should not be about the suburbs and, and the downtown core. Uh, this would be an amazing opportunity for not only those that live here in all corners of the city, but for those that come. There's no doubt about it. Um, but what we're trying to address here is how we're going to pay for it. And I think uh, it's upon us to be honest about it. Um, 
you know, uh, the, the fact of the matter is that uh, the, the, the train has left the station, okay? Uh, the, this type of a plan, when that kind of intensification came to this downtown core starting 15 years ago, that's when this plan should have been put into place. So you've got developers now that are long gone with the money, and we're trying to put together some kind of formula because we don't want to say that the, the taxpayer in this city is going to pay for the majority of the park. That's the fact. They're going to pay for the majority of the park. I think we need to be honest with people. It's not saying that we don't need it. We do. I'm, I'm happy that the, the current, our current mayor brought this forward because it's something we need. But, but we failed in this council chamber 20 years ago when a vision wasn't brought forward. And the, the ultimate result is going to be that the taxpayers across the entire city are going to pay for this. When I look at the recommendations where Section 42, cash in lieu, um, uh, collected from development and activity be applied towards uh, project costs in a way that does not negatively affect the impact on parkland revenue generated from other areas of the city. Good luck. How does that work? So I'm, I'm hopeful, but I'm, 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 uh, I, I have a lot of doubt about that. Um, you know, a phased approach for implementation of the construction of Rail Deck Park. Uh, does that make it more expensive? Um, what I really like is, is number seven, and this is probably the, the biggest structural problem in our city when it comes to building out infrastructure, why we're deficient in all aspects of infrastructure, not just in parkland in the city. And number seven, it says, City Council requests the Province of Ontario to amend the Development Charges Act of 1997 and to make necessary regulation in order to uh, exempt Rail Dead Park from all these different types of service levels that this, this uh, horrible Development Charges Act uh, stipulates we must adhere to. That's the problem right there. The province, when they reviewed the Development Charges Act over the last few years, I was there on behalf of council to depute on the needs of this city, told us to take a hike. Okay, So it's, it's good that it's in there. But it's the province who uh, refuses to ensure that uh, development or developers pay for the infrastructure they need to bring people into the city. It's not working. It's very broken. And until they step up, and I remember when I deputed on behalf of this council, and I said that developers are not paying their fair share, that increasing the price of development charges would not increase the price of homes. I remember. Uh, I, I guess he's now the, the Minister of Housing who was there on behalf, of the, on behalf of the province that looked at me and said, but isn't Toronto have the lowest tax jurisdiction in all the GTA? And that's really, uh, you know, it paints a real picture what the province is thinking. So just because we're the lowest tax citizen, the developer shouldn't have to pay, we should just raise our taxes. So let's, let's understand that Rail Dead Park is, is a must, it has to happen. Great cities have infrastructure like this. But we're going to pay for it because the developers are long gone. The ones that are coming now, if we increase development charges or cash in lieu, it's because they're already paying too low and we've got all kinds of needs across this city. We just need to be honest with people. I'll be supporting this, but I'll be looking really, really closely at how we're really going to pay for this in the coming years. Thank you. Thank you. Last speaker, Mayor Tory. Uh, very much, Madam Speaker, and uh, I found this to be a very interesting and constructive uh, debate, I think pretty well without exception, and I appreciate that. I think we all do, and it probably shows this council at its best. Uh, I'll come back to the matter of, uh, of something that has been described as a dog when, in fact, I think it is a shining example of what we should be doing here. But I, I want to begin by thanking our staff. Um, this uh, is something that's been sort of the idea has been kind of floating around for a while. And uh, all I did was to kind of say, look, let's really do some work on this and take it seriously. And, of course, the work that has to get done gets done by staff in the city. And I think they've done a great job bringing it this far and starting to bring it to life uh, as an idea with some of the facts becoming better known to us now. And there's lots more, of course, uh, to be done. I, uh, I, I, have the, I have both the luxury and the obligation in my job uh, of, of looking at everything from the standpoint of the entire city. I don't have a, a smaller part of the city that I represent. I represent everybody, every single neighborhood that all of you uh, represent as, in, as individuals. And, and, and I can tell you what a privilege and a joy that it is. And I find that when I go across the city, as I do a lot, to, to a lot of different events, um, people actually take much more of a kind of all for one and one for all approach than we think. And those who come here and say, my people don't want this for the city, don't want things that are good, I think, 
don't fully represent or maybe they're just listening to people that tell them what they want to hear. I think people understand the fact that the quality of life in the city as a whole is what is going to define us, not the quality of life where any particular person sits. And that our obligation, whether it is on transit or whether it is on parks or whether it is on shelters or, you know, a long, long list of things we could talk about, um, really requires all of us. Because while we were sent here to represent a ward, the reason that everybody was given a vote on citywide matters is so that we would all, in that instance, take the citywide perspective and say, what is best for the whole city? And so I really actually believe in my heart that what is good for Scarborough is good for Etobicoke or what is good for North York is good for Etobicoke. And I actually believe most of the people we collectively represent, I represent them all in, in the, the privileged position I have, that that's the way they feel too. Sometimes it takes some persuading. It takes certainly a degree of responsibility to, um, to sort of acknowledge that something that's going to help your neighbor um, is something that's good for you. I remember, uh, I don't know how many of you remember the, the documentary called Sicko, which was about the healthcare system. It was one of those Michael Moore documentaries. And he was on a golf cart with a Canadian doctor. And he was trying to make the case, of course, that our healthcare system is better. And he turns to the doctor and he says, now, he says, people that live here, um, they pay their health premiums. And don't they get upset when they don't have any health problems and the guy down the street has a you know, quadruple bypass and it costs the system a fortune? And the doctor, I was, I was very proud to be a Canadian because the doctor just turned to him and said, no, don't you understand? That's the whole idea, that we do these things together and that we build up a great country and make sure we all stay healthy. And it's the same with building parks and building transit and, and looking after people who need uh, shelter. And so I just think this is a project will at one and the same time be, yes, something that is going to remedy a deficiency that exists in the downtown with respect to parkland. And, you know, Councillor DiCiano's right. I mean, that, allowed, that was allowed to happen over a long period of time, not deliberately by people who said, let's sit around and make sure there's no parks downtown, but we somehow managed to pass the developments easier than we managed to approve the parks. And secondly, it is going to be an iconic park for people across the city. They will come and visit it by the thousands and by the millions, as they do. Look no further than London and New York. And, uh, and other cities. You could name a whole bunch of cities where these great public attractions attract people from all over those cities because they want to be there to enjoy it. And then finally, of course, this is going to be a park that is going to attract people from all over the world. It's going to be iconic because, further to the comments of Councillor uh, Shen, we're going to do it right and we're going to do it accessible. We're going to do it that it is just a place people want to be. And so I just think, again, uh, you know, people who talk about it being the suburbs versus downtown are, are playing political games. That's what they're doing. Because this is about the city as a whole and everybody benefiting it. And I look at the cost, Madam Speaker, and I say, well, the cost versus buying parks in small chunks, we've heard about that. The cost of this is no more or, or even less, perhaps, than the cost of buying a whole bunch of little parks that you could barely have three families have a picnic in if you're buying this land uh, downtown or in lots of parts of the city. And, of course, then there's the cost relative to doing nothing which I think is a huge cost that nobody will thank us for in 25 years. And I will just ask two questions to conclude, Madam Speaker. Number one, what will people be saying about this in 25 years? And I believe if one of the tests that I certainly try to apply to myself is, what are the things we're doing today that will make sure we're one of the most livable cities in the world in 25 years, because those are the decisions we make today, I believe they'd say yes 25 years from now to this park. And the second question I ask is the one that I posed at the beginning of our meeting today, and that is this. Which choice would people make for the future of our city today? Number one, the status quo. A rail corridor which is ugly, although use, uh, you know, necessary, but it's not fulfilling any productive purpose beyond the trains. Number two, more condo towers. I think we have enough of those in that particular part of town. And number three, an iconic, historic, globally recognized citywide asset. Not a dog, I say with respect to my <laughs> friend next to me, but a, but a gem, a gem that people are going to thank uh, the council of this day for, for putting the uh, investment and, the, and their hearts behind to get it done. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Okay, let's uh, vote. I, th I believe that there's only one motion. Motion by Councillor Mamaliti, recorded vote.
Members, we were late opening the vote, so please uh, be sure you've pressed one of the buttons. Councillor Carroll, please. Councillor Thompson. Members, we were late opening the vote, so if you're... Mayor Tory, please. Councillor Palacio, Councillor Crisanti, Councillor Fletcher. <coughs> Councillor Mahevic, please. Councillor DiGiorgio, please. Councillor Grimes, please. <laughs> Councillor Shiner, please, and Councillor Pasternak. <laughs> Councillor Doucette, please. Councillor McMahon, please. The motion does not carry. The vote is 6 to 33. Chaos. Hang on I, a second, no, 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 no. <laughs> Come on, <laughs> shake my hand. I thought. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Mr. Mayor. Shake uh, uh, okay, um, this I is. I had already voted, then somebody called upon me to vote again, and I then just pushed green. But I, somebody will have to. Uh, I would ask that we reopen the vote. <laughs> okay, Mo motion to reopen on favor carried. So let's try this again. Now, this is the first time the mayor has done this. It was the second. I don't remember the other time. Okay, on the item, I mean, on the mo well, Councillor Mamaliti's motion. We're voting on Councillor Mamaliti right now. Please. The motion does not carry. The vote is four to thirty five. <clears throat> okay. On the item, recorded vote. Oh, yes, uh, members. So we're going to be voting, where, but there's two items. So first, we'll be voting on page four, the X29.2, the Royal Deck Park. We're voting on that first. Recorded vote. Councillor DiGiorgio, please. Councillor Layton, please. The item carries 35 to 4. Okay, our next item is page 14, uh, which is T28.7, uh, Rail Deck Park, official plan amendment, recorded vote. Councillor Layton, please. Councillor Cole, please. And Councillor Fragadakis, when you're seated. The item carries 36 to 4. Okay, thank you.
Okay, members, um, members of council. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, it's 25 to 6, and we are going to um, recess at 6 o'clock. So my recommendation is we have uh, a couple members' motions that have to be introduced, and why don't we see if we can do some quick items, yeah. right? Yeah. There's no point of starting the next yeah. item because we've only got 20 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Um, Councillor Robinson. Oh, I have a quick, I have a quick release. So it's PW 25.6. What page? Uh, that's a really good question. Gary, what page? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not on the... I'm working. I shouldn't have pushed the button so quickly. Gary's on this. A page 10, PW 25.9. Next yes, steps. That for is it. Thank you. So I'd like to release that. No, it's 25.9. Why do you want this? It's just the word from. No, it's PW 25.6 and the added... Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, so you want to release parking time limit on Winona Drive. That's exactly right. Okay. Okay, so Councillor Robinson is releasing. Councillor Mahavik, are you okay with this? Uh, not yet, not yet. All I right. just need a quick review, sir. Just a due diligence check, that's all. All right. Is there a technical amendment from staff? Yeah, so Councillor Mahavik, what is your problem? All right. All right, that's fine. Councillor DiGiorgio. Um, on page nine, Madam Speaker, I'd like to release uh, Planning and Growth Committee item PG 24.5, technical amendments to zoning bylaw 569. To, you're just releasing it? Just releasing it. Okay, on page 9, PW, PG 24.5, Councillor DiGiorgio is releasing. On favor, carried. Councillor Fletcher. Yes, uh, Speaker. Page 5. It is um, EX 29.8, finalizing the consolidation of Civic Theatres Toronto. I'd like to move that and also just thank everyone for incredible work in getting us to this point, including Councillor Crawford, who has showed tremendous leadership in uh, consolidating these theatres, and also to all the economic development staff that have made this possible. Okay, thank you. So on page 5, EX 29.8, Councillor Fletcher is releasing. On favor, carried. Did you want a recorded vote? Okay, recorded vote. Councillor Peruzza, your vote, please. The item carries 38 to 1. Okay. Councillor Kergianis. Thank you, Madam Chair. On page 3, uh, PW 24.3, I do have a motion. If staff can put it up. Quick release. Councillor Fletcher, um, Councillor Kergianis is going to release PW 24.3, the utility locate services for BIA. I do. 
Uh, Madam Speaker, it's uh, going from 50% uh, down to 100% the city is responsible for. It is there and it's a quick release. The BIAs? <laughs> All right, I'm holding it. I'll continue holding it. It's not, well, that's why I wanted to repeat it. Councillor Cressy. Uh, thank you, Speaker. On page 17, on um, item CC 35.10, that is 350, 370, and 390 Queens Key West, uh, OMB appeal, request for direction. I have a motion that has been advanced circulated that I can move now, which is to continue to oppose the, uh, the application. Yes, it has been circulated. It's your pink. pink. That's right. Okay. So, um, Councillor Cressy is moving the amendment on favor, carried that on the item, on fa that was the item, on fa carried, okay. Um, thank you. Councillor Davis. I'm not sure if this is read, oh it is, Marilyn just identified that. Uh, page 14 at the bottom, TE 28.59. Um, Councillor Perks held it, but we were waiting for a report. Um, so there's a supplementary report. I'd like to move and adopt the recommendations in the supplementary report. Yep. Are you okay, Em? Yep. Oh, I'm <laughs> So on page 14, T28.59, parking amendment, Strathmore Boulevard. So if we can put, okay. Uh, they're not ready yet. It's not the right motion. Councillor Shiner. Madam Speaker, on page 4, EX 29.7, development of a low carbon thermal energy networks. I would like to release that. Okay, Councillor Shiner is releasing on page 4, EX 29.7. On favor? Carried. Madam Speaker. Yes. On page 4, I do too. EX 29.5, citywide real estate amendments to municipal chapters and shareholder direction. I can also release that too. Okay, on page 4, EX 29.5, count. Pardon? Councillor Shiner is releasing recorded vote. Councillor Cole, Councillor Frakadakis, please. Councillor Karajanis, please. The item carries 35 to 2. Thank you. Oh, sorry, 36 to 2. Councillor Palacio. Thanks, Speaker. Page 5. EX 29.19 2018 raised supported budget, solid waste management service. I have my questions answered, but I would like to ask for a recorded vote. <coughs> recorded vote? Yes, please. I'm, I'm sorry, Councillor Crawford? I think that item's a timed item for Thursday, for solid waste budget? Yeah. yeah. It's timed for Thursday morning. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's right. Yes, that's fine. Okay, any more quick releases? Okay. So are we ready for that's, that's so easy. Give me a picture. Okay. Davis? Yes. You're introducing a motion? Am I? Yeah. Oh yes. <laughs> yes. I'm introducing a motion. <laughs> it's urgent. 
It's about a liquor license application for 2620 Danforth Avenue. Okay, on favor, carried. Councillor Burnside. Yeah, thank you. Introducing a motion. <laughs> well, you can read it. I mean, sounds really urgent. It's, it's an impassioned plea for the motion. Well, I can explain it if you like. Essentially, well, I may as well talk. If not, why not, eh? Um, essentially, the uh, Burnside. Yeah. Oh, that was hurtful. Okay. That was, it's very urgent. It's, uh, the Heritage Department has decided to weigh in on the, on the matter, and that's why it's a last minute is, okay. uh, situation. Okay. On favor? Carried. Councillor Cressy. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, this is urgent as uh, the funds are required in order to complete the extension of the Bentway project towards Bathurst. On favor? Carried. Is that it? Councillor Ajamari, you have a motion to introduce the confirming bill. That leave be granted to introduce a bill to confirm to the point of the introduction of this motion the proceedings of City Council meeting 35 on December 5, 2017. Shall leave be granted to introduce this bill recorded vote? Councillor McMahon, please. Councillor Davis. Councillor Cole, Councillor Troisi, thank you very much. The motion to introduce the confirming bill carries unanimously 38 in favor. Shall this bill be passed and declared as a bylaw recorded vote? Councillor Peruzza, please. Councillor Layton. Councillor Davis. Councillor Perks, please. Councillor Karagiannis. Deputy Mayor Minnan Wong, please. Councillor Fletcher. Councillor Cole. Councillor Mahevic. And Councillor DiCiano, please. The motion to enact the confirming bill carries unanimously 38 in favor. Okay, thank you members. We're recessed to tomorrow, 9.30.